evening. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, February the 5th, 2024. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth, and I will uh, now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Diane Mahan. Here. Steve DeCourcy. Here. Leonard Diggins. Here. Uh, Ashley Marr. Here. Attorney Cunningham. Here. Jim Feeney. Here. All right. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format as provided by the Massachusetts Legislature. Before we begin, please note the following. This meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. If you're participating by Zoom, you may be visible to others. If you wish to participate over Zoom, uh, or in the room, we ask you to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those people are not asked to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the website, specifically the Select Board Agendas and Minutes page. And because one or one uh, or more select board members are participating remotely tonight, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. And I will rely on Attorney Cunningham and the members of the team to remind the chair of this situation. There will be opportunities for public comment this evening, both in the people who are present physically and on Zoom. We, we have two public hearings, items six and seven, followed by open forum. At that time when I announce it, if you wish to participate in public comment over Zoom, please raise your hand. If you don't know how to raise your hand in Zoom, now would be an excellent time to Google for how to do so. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. And a select board member, Mr. John Hurd, is in route and uh, will be joining us shortly. So first up, we have the FY25 Town Manager's Buzzet presentation, and I'll turn this over to Town Manager Jim Feeney. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and if I could, I'd like to invite up uh, Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager and Finance Director. Excellent. And I was thinking for uh, ease of broadcast, I would probably join him at the table if we're going to be going back and forth. Excellent. We have a uh, presentation come up on the screen. I know you've just missed the hot seat, Mr. Feeney. Do four hands up the middle here. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, members of the board. So uh, as the chair mentioned, we have the budget presentation for you tonight for fiscal year 2025. Uh, next slide. So for an overview, we're going to speak a little bit about the budget process that was followed, uh, the budget overview itself at a high level some of the highlights of the budget, a discussion of the long-term outlook, and finally, the next steps. And I think before uh, delving into the specifics, I would just say it's already been sort of a interesting budget season so far. You know, with, we're, we're starting to get different figures in from different entities. You know, health insurance is coming in uh, in terms of premiums higher than uh, expected or projected, the GIC is looking at growth anywhere estimated between 8 and 10 percent. As folks know, we often carry a 5 percent growth projection there. So, you know, that, that will come into further focus come March when uh, the GIC finalizes their numbers. But that, given it's such a large budget, budget amounted to about, you know, a $1 million swing as compared to what was projected. Uh, also, the, the pension projection, uh, the actuals are coming in a little bit over 6%, and we would normally project uh, around 5.5%. So uh, that certainly was not favorable. And then finally, which we'll uh, allude to later, the, the biggest change since you received your FY25 budget book was the change in state aid. Uh, we had believed to have been conservatively estimating uh, state aid, i.e., uh, chapter 70 for education to grow at approximately 5%, and it in fact uh, grew at only 1%. So with respect to the previously approved long-range plan, uh, given that debt, you know, we're now showing 
a deficit of approximately uh, one million dollars in FY 26, but we will discuss some options tonight that we're going to look into further as the budget uh, season progresses to address that uh, shortfall. Uh, I will say, though, it wasn't necessarily all bad news. We did get good news from the Minuteman School District that for uh, the first time in some time, our uh, community allotment is going to be going down by approximately $350,000 in uh, fiscal year 25, and that in fact there was a surplus in our fiscal year 24 appropriation that all of the member communities uh, earlier this winter uh, voted to use to fund the outstanding uh, debt for the building project that was previously uh, debt excluded here in Arlington. Uh, so that means there was a balance to be financed that was coming due via uh, a ban that will no longer need to be issued as a bond and Arlington's taxpayers will not see the Minuteman School Building Project show up uh, on their tax bills again. So. Uh, Without further ado, I'll t if you want to go to the next slide, Ash, turn it over to Alex to talk in detail about the process and some of the revenue and expenditure figures. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Manager. So um, you guys are all very aware of our process, but to enlighten some of our viewers um, at home, we'll talk about sort of the, this is not just a one or two month process. It takes um, you know, many months to get through. We're probably about 65% of the way through the budget process at this point, maybe a little more. Um, Really, we start in earnest. Uh, as you all know, our fiscal year starts July 1st of every year. Um, in mid to late August, we issue our capital instructions to all of our department heads. Uh, capital requests then come in and are considered um, on a parallel track starting in November. We do the same thing for our operating budgets. Um, all of our department heads receive instructions and um, they make operating request to us and then at that point we sort of have two parallel tracks running one for capital and one for operating um, the months of november and december are spent in a frenzy getting the budget recommendations put together which is then delivered in january of every year to um, to this board um, starting in january in earnest and running through town meeting time is when the finance committee is doing their budget review procedures. Um, they're in the middle of that right now. Many of our departments have already had their uh, meetings with their finance committee uh, subcommittees. Um, in March, the financial plan will be uh, put together and delivered to the select board and FinCom. Um, April, the finance committee's report will be put together and delivered to town meeting. And then in April, or hopefully May, you know, hopefully not beyond that, um, town meeting will vote and adopt a capital and operating budget. Um, and then in June, fiscal year ends, and then we start the process all over again. So it really is a long cycle to get through a budget. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, uh, Mr. Pinkett, uh, thank you very much. I just want to do a quick tech check because my Zoom connection has gone down. Are we still online as far as you know, Ms. Marr? As far as I know, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Please continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, high level budget um, revenue figures coming in. Um, our property tax is showing high growth. That is due to uh, the override. Um, so that's a 7.6% increase. Uh, normally that would be com uh, comprised just of new growth uh, and 2.5% um, on top of that. Uh, local receipts, sort of our standard 4% growth. Um, that's a, still a relatively conservative figure there. Um, state aid, uh, we're coming in just at a modest 1.3% growth. Free cash, um, we're looking at a larger number here. Um, that is due to a, a likely higher 10-year trailing average compared to our last year. Um, and our other funds, we're gonna see a huge drop there. Um, this is because we no longer have the ability to appropriate from ARPA towards uh, revenue replacement. So we'll be seeing a drop of about $5 million there. Um, and then override stabilization fund, we'll see a significant growth there um, to offset and balance our budget at the end of the year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this just gives you a visual sense of where our revenues are coming from. Uh, the big, large Pac-Man looking shape is uh, property tax, um, makes up 75% of our revenues. Um, state aid is the next biggest, the gray slot at 13%. Uh, local receipts um, at about 
uh, and then a smattering makes up the balance of about six more percent. Next slide. Uh, expenditures. Um, so after a very thorough process of putting together our, our budget, um, our expenditures are showing uh, about a 6% increase next year. Um, municipal departments, um, those are showing a 3.4% increase, um, but that really is lower than, it's more like 3.2%, um, which is in holding with our override commitments. Um, there's an additional $250,000 added to offset some of our solid waste and recycling <coughs> costs in there. Um, other significant changes, uh, as Mr. Feeney mentioned earlier, uh, Minuteman, we're seeing a reduction in the costs there. Uh, the school department, we're going to see an increase, um, and this is, again, part of our override commitment, so they're rising to the tune of about 8%. Um, our non-departmental, so this is health care and pensions, um, we are taking some big growth there, unfortunately. Um, capital and debt service, um, this is growing steadily with our budget. Uh, warrant articles, that number fluctuates annually based on sort of what sort of warrant articles we are anticipating. Um, and then the reserve fund as well, when our budget grows, that uh, accordingly grows with it. Um, our bottom line expenditure budget is anticipated at uh, $218 million next year. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is just a graphic representation of what we just looked at. Uh, the large orange section is our um, Arlington Public School Department. Minuteman is the gray slice just next to it. So uh, put together, um, our education costs roughly 48% of the town's expenditure budget. Um, our non-departmental sort of unclassified costs make up 19% uh, of our total expenditures. Those are the yellow um, slice over there. Our sort of town hall operating budgets uh, make up around 20% of our total expenditures. Um, capital makes up about 11%. Um, one thing I'd like to note, that's typically a 5% of our budget is our capital plan, but we have um, a fair amount of excluded debt that we're paying for the high school project, uh, which brings that number up. And then the balance is paid. Um, we reserve 600,000 in the overlay for abatements and unpaid uh, property taxes. A little over $2 million, which is just 1% of our revenue number uh, for the Finance Committee's Reserve Fund, and then again about 1% for our Warren Articles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, back to you, Jim. Sure. And one other thing that I would note on the prior slide, though it's not necessarily a big part of the town's budget, if you see the elections line, uh, that is growing significantly in FY25 because it is a presidential election year, and then the, the following years would not require the same uh, appropriated <coughs> commitment. Uh, with respect to what we'll call the highlights, Alex noted before that there's uh, a hair over 6% of expenditure growth. What we have here for uh, board's edification is just noting that the override commitments, as you will, that arrive from the long range planning committee and that are adopted by this board is the town's budget is growing uh, by 3.22% uh, save for that one-time bump via the override in the uh, solid waste and recycling budget. And then same thing for the school budget is growing by uh, $4,073,000 and change, which is a, you know, blended growth rate of 4.56%, but then there will also be the uh, $3,100,000 override commitment uh, being added to the school's budget in addition to the uh, agreed upon growth rates. So <clears throat> what we'll speak to now is sort of the, uh, the, the town's operating budget or the municipal departmental budgets. So Alex outlined a pretty extensive process. So what that process brought from department heads was uh, 38 new expense requests uh, totaling $830,000. Uh, to date, and what was approved uh, for inclusion in the manager's proposed FY25 budget was uh, 20 new expense requests uh, totaling uh, approximately $270,000 of added expense to the town's budget. So 
you know, we'll, on the next slide, we'll go through some of those uh, line by line, but at the highest level, uh, they respect to a pretty big increase in utility costs. Uh, the town is now in a new year of our agreement for supply charges, and we are seeing approximately a 40% increase to what we had been paying uh, per kilowatt hour in this year's Eversource uh, winter rates saw the distribution and transmission side of our bill rise approximately 10%. So electricity costs are, are hitting us pretty hard. Uh, and in the facilities department, there are also increases with respect to our uh, ongoing uh, building maintenance contracts. So we typically procure three-year deals and with each year, there are particular escalators for growth within those contracts, whether it be for custodial cleaning, uh, elevator maintenance, roof maintenance, electrical, plumbing, and HVAC services. Those are all scheduled to grow contractually each year. Uh, in the uh, Department of Public Works budget, we're seeing, uh, we're infusing some more money for street light repairs and replacements. Uh, believe it or not, our LED streetlights are now more than 10 years old and have exited the warranty period. So for the past 10 years when they burn out, we were able to make a warranty replacement call and get them replaced. However, now the town will be uh, bearing uh, that cost unless and until we're able to do another sort of wholesale replacement and get them back under a warranty period. We will uh, own those costs. Similarly, for field maintenance noted at the bottom, uh, you know, that is another contract that's competitively procured uh, for three years at a time. And between year one, year two, and year three, we see a particular growth pattern. And uh, this line is to fund that growth. What I would say with respect to sort of new services or adding services are the two lines uh, in the middle. So in the IT department, we had to make some investments in a new internet service provider line that would be brought into uh, the police station on Mystic Street to support the future body-worn camera program that would require a significant amount of uh, data given the video footage that would need to be uploaded daily and should be on its uh, own trunk line. We would also be proposing to make investments in cybersecurity. Uh, I think Holistically, we've seen that no longer are public entities, including municipalities, school departments, water utilities, and other uh, you know, public business offerings, sort of no longer subject to cybersecurity threats. We are now uh, facing sort of a growing and evolving threat on an almost daily basis. We're seeing new and more sophisticated uh, phishing threats and attempts to, you know, implant malware or ransomware. You know, we have seen other communities in Massachusetts, you know, fall victim to their networks being compromised. So we're looking at finally making an investment in cybersecurity on the town side, but that of course would benefit uh, the organization as a whole, as well as doing some uh, annual penetration testing, a little bit of disaster response and preparedness work but also looking into an endpoint detection and response platform that would uh, basically live on uh, the entirety of our network and regularly crawl looking for uh, embedded threats and be able to take immediate response to them. So, uh, you know, a pretty significant investment in cybersecurity, something that will benefit the entire organization, as well as a proposed uh, GIS or graphic information system platform modernization. We've been on the same platform for a number of years. Uh, it is no longer meeting our needs operationally, nor is it uh, fully supportive of the public use of our GI, uh, GIS information. So we'd be looking to move to the uh, industry standard Esri Arc GIS platform that is uh, better supported more robust and has uh, a larger suite of tools that we could avail ourselves to for asset management, work orders, and is again something that serves, you know, the school department as it relates to, you know, drawing districts, uh, the town, whether it be planning and community development, 
uh, engineering. Any number of departments use that platform, so it's a wise investment because it uh, will impact a number of departments' operations. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Could I, just while he's on this point, because yeah. that was one of my two questions, um, on, on the cybersecurity enhancement, um, I know when I was on long range planning about two years ago, that was a, a conversation that came up and the gentleman from Powers and Sullivan and Mr. Foskett, myself and others, definitely highlighted that as a, as a really pressing need. Is, are you saying that, and, and I agree, it should be. So when I saw the cyber security enhancement only at 5,000, to me that doesn't even uh, scratch at it. But uh, from yeah. what, from your remarks, are you saying that to address that particular folder of concern that also the monies for endpoint detection and response um, applies to that? Or are you saying with the new IT director and the IT staff we have, the 5,000 K plus that? Because I think we need a lot more, mm -hmm. um, and I know it was identified two years ago and I haven't been in the past two years because it's chair and vice chair that goes. So, but I also don't want to be like laying out my whole hand of what our um, cyber security mm -hmm. A to Z point plan is. So uh, is there like a short answer to that or the, should I call you tomorrow on that? Or? I, I would say the short answer is yes. Th those two lines taken together would outline what is proposed in this uh, fiscal year 25 budget for enhancing cybersecurity. One other thing I will note is that we were just awarded a state grant for fiscal year 24 to uh, enhance cybersecurity awareness and conduct training uh, throughout the organization within the current fiscal year. And frankly, that training element is one of the most important uh, pieces for our staff and to help, uh, you know, protect the organization. It's about, frankly, not clicking the links. So we will undergo training this year, but uh, those investments are the first step that we're making next year. And, and the enhancements, um on the town side, of course, I'm concerned about everything, whether you're paying a bill online, um, whether it's the actual software of what we need to run a town, whether it's the uh, GIS or the body camera systems. Does that also envelop on the school side or do, do they have a separate um, software IT department and allocation to address their cybersecurity enhancements that they should be making? So with respect to that question, I think this is one of those elements that when you do make an investment, it has a benefit to the entire organization. Okay. So th these tools that we would be uh, purchasing or any testing that we undertake would uh, sort of be available on the town's entire network. So it's not just the 5K, it's the 47, it's the grant you spoke about and anything else in the future. Thank you, Mr. Correct. Chair. Sorry to jump. I just yep. didn't want him to have to go back to that. Thank you. All right. So, and just to sort of close out this side, obviously, you know, the town's budget doesn't just grow. Oh, excuse me. I forgot one other item. In terms of personnel, the one proposed addition with respect to personnel on the town side's budget is uh, one that totals approximately $18,000, and that is to introduce one part-time uh, circulation librarian at the Robbins Library with the intention of finally restoring uh, Thursday morning hours at the Robbins Library that were uh, discontinued some, uh, I believe, 20 years ago. So this would provide the necessary staffing to make that change, but also support the fact that we, you know, the Arlington Library System has the fifth highest circulation in the state. It has grown by over 25 percent since uh, 2019, and our, our programs are the 10th most well-attended library programs in the entire state. So with that and with the growing and interesting library of things we offer, uh, in terms of the complexity of those items and the number of items as those grow, it requires a little bit of uh, circulation support. So the one proposed addition in the general fund budget is for one part-time circulation librarian. Uh, and as I started to say, the remaining funds available to the town via its budget growth would be put into 
the salary reserve for future collective bargaining agreements. So uh, each and every one of our collective bargaining units uh, is up for bargaining. So you know our last contract cycle ran uh, from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 24. So we are now be entering bargaining for a prospective uh, three-year contract running uh, for fiscal years 25, 26, and 27. You know, a couple things that I will call out in terms of uh, budget reductions that were made. We did uh, cut $20,000 from the town's postage budget, and that was via agreement with the school department in terms of uh, right-sizing who was uh, paying for different postage and mailing services. Uh, we eliminated uh, $7,000 from the IT budget for some phone lines that were no longer necessary, some uh, related to cell phones, but some also related to hard lines for, you know, that aren't necessarily any longer at uh, certain school buildings or, uh, so we right-sized that and then not shown yet is a nearly $3,000 reduction on a software platform that uh, we are continuing to phase out with respect to our water meter system. So we still have uh, old software for the time being that allows us to access old data from an old metering system, but that we're hoping uh, over the next few years to fully phase out. So the next slide is just a rundown of sort of all of the expense requests that, as I said, total 270,000. Uh, we talked about uh, most of the substantive ones, of course, there are occasional lines for, you know, software subscription increases for 3,000 or advertising and printing lines going up by $1,000, but I think we spoke to the uh, largest increases. And then with that, I would turn it back over to Alex. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, so very important to our budget is maintaining the override commitments that are made um, to, you know, by this board to the public um, when considering an override. And so this budget uh, achieves that. Um, and we'll just run through these points briefly. Uh, maintaining the commitment in regards to fiscal discipline. Um, this maintains sort of the growth caps uh, within the sort of areas that were stated. So three and a quarter percent uh, increases on the town side, three and a half percent on the general education budget, and six and a half percent on the special education budget. Um, maintains the board's commitment to responding to ongoing school enrollment pressures. Um, this uh, includes a 50 percent uh, per student increase on the, the Department of DESE's uh, annual per student funding level. Um, maintains the commitment to building in Arlington future. So this um, maintains certain commitments annually during the years of the override um, to make targeted investments. Um, separate from this budget, but already planned and have already undertaken. Um, an example of this, but you know, looking for looking out for our seniors is uh, the senior circuit tax breaker um, legislation that the uh, town has supported. Um, and it maintains, and this is very important to me, to keeping a 5% financial reserve uh, for the duration of this plan. Um, maintaining our AAA bond rating is of paramount importance. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Jim mentioned our long-range plan revenue shortfall, uh, and we'll look at this in a little more detail now. Um, this is basically tied to a our Chapter 70 aid coming in at a lower level than we had anticipated. Um, we anticipated, based on our um, the continuation of the Student Opportunity Act, that we were going to be growing our Chapter 70 aid at a slightly higher level than we have in the past. Um, that is, was not the case under the governor's budget this year. We came in at just under 1% uh, in growth. And so this created a little bit of uh, a ripple into our out years of our long range plan. Um, and so when this ripple is compounded over two years, FY 25 and 26, it creates a roughly $1 million deficit in uh, FY 26. And so uh, next slide, please. Um, this is likely too small for you to see up there, but this gives a snapshot of um, the long range plan as the Governor's budget came out, um, so this is after the town manager's budget book came out. And 
you'll see that really what's important is that the bottom of our FY26, you'll see a red number down there. Um, and that just shows an imbalance. We're heavy on the expenditure side in FY26 to the tune of about a million dollars. Um, and so we're going to look now at some potential budget adjustments that we can use to help fill that, uh, that gap. Um, and Jim and I will probably tag team this a little bit. Sure. Um, should I take revenues? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, first we should look at the revenue side of the ledger. Um, one thing that we are comfortable in, uh, in recommending to grow in terms of our projected revenue is our ambulance receipts. Um, as this board knows, we collect our ambulance revenue differently than we had in the past. Um, with less money going into our ambulance revolving fund and more money going into the general fund, which is a local receipt. And so um, because of that, we, uh, are, we're currently budgeted at about fi at $500,000 for FY25, and we're confident that we could increase that number um, by some. Uh, to give a sense of the last two years, um, last year we came in at a million dollars, just under a million dollars in total revenue in FY24, uh, and this is through November, actually. We're at $522,000. Um, so we anticipate landing probably just over $1.1 million, somewhere in that range, for FY24. So there's a little bit of room there. Um, annually, uh, we request surplus um, appropriations from the overlay reserve surplus account. Um, currently, that account is at about $3.1 million. Uh, as we all know, we're still in the middle of a fiscal year, and so the Board of Assessors has other items that they are considering, other abat abatements to grant, et cetera. So, um, but uh, the town manager, uh, the director of assessing, Dana, and myself have met and discussed this um, concept, and there is likely a little bit of capacity to go after there as well. And then uh, new growth. Um, we're budgeted at $700,000 right now. Um, the last two years have come in just over 1.2 and almost $1.3 million. And with what we know is currently in the pipeline in FY25, uh, there is likely some room in there as well. So we'll, we're looking at these and other areas uh, to potentially uh, bolster our revenue figures. Uh, in, in what I would say with respect to the last two, uh, given that they are within the realm of both the assessor and the board of assessors, is just a reminder that, you know, that's sort of an annual process where, you know, these figures get reviewed with not only the director of assessors, but the board, and it's obviously up to the board of assessors to determine how much, if any, of the overlay reserve surplus uh, they're willing to dedicate to sort of the, the revenue side of the ledger, but it is the case customarily in Arlington that every few years there is, you know, some more significant uh, drawdown of that account to ensure that it is uh, right-sized. You know, one other thing that I would mention with respect to the revenue side of things is, you know, part of obviously Arlington's long-range plan relies on the use of override stabilization funds. Uh, that fund has a significant balance in it currently. and. Interest rates were, uh, you know, held steady by the Fed last week, so rates remain high. And one thing that we're monitoring almost monthly is the actual balance in that account, given that it's generating uh, over $100,000 a month in interest. So as, as the months pass and we're not yet to draw down, due to draw down from it, uh, it does create a more favorable outlook in terms of the long-range plan. Right. Expenditures. Um, so expenditures. Um, there is potentially some capacity to use some ARPA funding with respect to some of our warrant articles. Um, there are very rigid rules with how you can and cannot use your ARPA funding. Um, and so we are looking into exactly what may or may not qualify. Um, we're confident that there are a couple that we can fund with ARPA and we're still kind of um, dotting our I's and crossing our T's with respect to that. Um, so specifically, the master plan is something that we're looking at. There's a warrant article um, beginning sort of uh, the sort of revisions of the master plan. On the 250th celebration, um, there are questions whether we can fund that with ARPA as well. Um, and then there are also a couple of targeted capital projects that we had slated with paying cash that we could consider funding with ARPA. Um, so we're looking at um, how to supplement our, our funding 
uh, with sort of our grants that we have available as well. So, so the, the underlying uh, logic or premise there being, you know, you have these one-time funds, you really only want to use them to offset what would be one-time expenditures, and there are some new expenditures, especially via warrant articles, that aren't there year after year that may be ripe for uh, potentially offsetting with ARPA funding and helping the, the town's general fund sort of cash position. So I think, you know, those are just some things that we're already talking about internally and evaluating so that we can begin modeling. Uh, but of course, we're expecting, you know, much more uh, discourse with the, the Board of Assessors, as well as the Finance Committee, as well as, uh, you know, in the coming weeks, you know, bringing the, what I understand to be called, like the Revenue Working Group or Revenue Task Group together, and then uh, seeing where we land with that, and then reconvening the Long Range Planning Committee to ensure that we have a plan for presenting uh, a balanced budget, not only for fiscal year 25, but not showing any deficit through fiscal year 26 either as was committed to Arlington's voters during the November override. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll lead off with a couple of questions and then turn there to my colleagues for questions and discussion. Um, just on that last point, uh, do you know approximately how much ARPA funds, how, many ARPA, how much in ARPA funds we have that are not committed or, or otherwise obligated? We have a, I think it's around $9 million right now. Um, all of that funding must be what's termed committed by the end of calendar year 2024 yep. uh, and what committed means is we need to have um, contracts in place mm -hmm. okay so we can't just say we're going to spend it and have it in a document we it needs to be uh, we need to have it co contracted by that date Good. and and then second one is a question of the, of the timing of the process so you know the governor's budget is is out and you know we all know that the state budget cycle that you know the next thing we're going to hear will be the house's budget in april the senate in, in, in may and then we'll see when it gets enacted um obviously you have to go to town meeting with the budget you know much sooner than that so am i correct that for better or for worse even even if the chapter 78 were to increase which my recollection is that usually is what happens to some degree when in the final budget even if that were to happen we, we need to start with this lower than expected number that we've got now with respect to that and maybe the higher than expected number with aga but yeah, it, agreed, and I would just point out uh, for the board's benefit, for also those watching them, we are presenting a balanced budget for fiscal year 25, right. which is the one that would be, oh, yeah, right, right, yeah. you know, voted upon by the finance committee and ultimately town meeting. But you're right, we're going to have to watch that closely, but we need to be taking steps now to evaluate all the things that are well within our purview right. currently. Right. But we'll just, you know, continue to monitor the yeah, that is, that is that is important. I mean, obviously, if things are tighter in this in, in FY25, it may get key, cues things up to be yeah, difficult in 26 um, with respect to less left over. But I mean, the takeaway I've got is that you've identified some areas where we need to pay very close attention, but also some areas where some good news uh, may well come in, and, and some of it's likely to, you know, based on past experience and some you know, opportunities to look. So I, I'm I'm glad that you are. You know, on this now, and that we're the finance committee. And I want to also, you mentioned the chair, of the, the uh, board of assessors. I want to acknowledge the chair of the assessors is here here tonight in the in the room, and I, I appreciate Mr. Jamison being here because they certainly are a critical partner at all times. But I think now, especially when we need to really um, count all our chickens, um, it's a, it's good to have their active involvement for sure. Um, that's all for me, um, Mr. Hurd. Thank you for the presentation. I had a couple questions, but now I have a comment that just arose. Can we add an expenditure in here to flush out the steam pipes in Town Hall? Yeah. So we can have a meeting. We need to electrify Town Hall. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, relative to ARPA, at the beginning you mentioned the ARPA revenue loss, and it's not carrying over to the next fiscal year. Is there a reason why we can't? recover for our revenue loss, was that phased out, our ability to do so? We have reached the maximum extent allowable by Treasury, which in our case was $10 million, and that okay. was done $5 million each over the, the current fiscal year and the past fiscal year. Okay. So now, now we'd have to look at sort of one-time expenditures. Okay. And the increase in expenditures at 6%, where, I know with inflation, everything's going up. Where does that number lie within increases over the past, say the past couple of years? Is that on the high end or is that 
what's it, expected normally. Right, that's higher than normal, but um, it's worth mentioning that in FY25, there are two sort of additional expense increases, $3.1 million for the schools and 600000 for the town uh, that are tied to the override. And so um, those are embedded in that 6% number. They're sort of part of it. And so that drives that percentage way up. Yeah. And on school enrollment, uh, is I know during COVID, the increase had leveled off a little bit. Is the enrollment back on the, is it increasing at, at what percentage year over year? So, you know, this year the school department again added students. Uh, it was in the single digits. Okay. So compared to before COVID when it was you know, it, much, much. There, there was a period during COVID where, it, you know, enrollment actually went declined, down. but it is, you know, uh, back rising, but, you know, this year, you know, the data that we have indicates it was, you know, in this, the single digits. Okay. And then my last question, since Mr. Diggins isn't in the chamber with us, I'm gonna embody him and ask a curiosity question that just jumped out at me. What is the expenditure for mosquito control? <laughs> <laughs> so the- There's awful specific numbers. I just so the town, because it's via assessment, right? It's a number that's given to us. So we belong to the Eastern Middlesex Mosquito <laughs> Control Project, okay. which is a grouping of communities in Eastern Middlesex County uh, that all have sort of a, a joint agreement to uh, perform mosquito control activities on mass. So that is the treatment of our catch basins and some other areas in town. It's to undergo all the surveillance testing sites we have. So that is a very specific figure because it's prescribed to us via the state and said, you know, here's based on what the cost of those services is going to be in the following year, you need to program in your budget. Okay. And is it a new program this year? No. Uh, no, we, we've been a part of this program since, frankly, I worked in the Board of Health. If I could just add to that, um, every year the way that we determine exactly what our state aid is going to be is something called the cherry sheets. Um, and we receive our cherry sheet estimates uh, over the fall and winter. And uh, that is that shows all of the revenues that we can expect. On the flip side of that, there are also cherry sheet assessments. And so uh, mosquitoes is one of those assessments. And those bundle, they total around $4 million <coughs> this year. Right, that's it. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Feeney and Mr. McGee, congratulations on your first budget uh, yeah. submission. This is, uh, I believe you started last March, Mr. McGee. So right. the budget had already been submitted. Of course, this is your first budget, Mr. Feeney. So congratulations on, on getting through that. Now some comments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we had talked about in your original budget submission, I think there's been a lot in the news about what at least is in the governor's proposal on Chapter 70 and, and the so-called AGA, un, unrestricted. And you know there was some um, statements the governor made in the, in the news that AGA is going up 3% this year. Um, and for us, it's, as Mr. McGee said, it's just below 1%. I wonder if you could just comment just a little for the public's benefit those are the two main sources of local aid, but just the magnitude of each, because if you were to have a greater increase, you'd much rather have it on the Chapter 70 side than the Uga side. But if you can just maybe elaborate a little bit on, on those amounts. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I will note, uh, well, Alex pulls those exact figures. The Uga stands for Unrestricted General Government Aid, and that did, in fact, go up 3% this year for Arlington. Uh, and we had only projected 1% growth as we're usually fairly conservative in that estimate. So that actually resulted in a, uh, obviously a, you know, uh, some excess in terms of state aid for the town, but with respect to its size and magnitude with the other makeup of state aid being chapter 70 education aid, uh, only growing at 1%, it actually results in that $650,000 revenue shortfall. But if you want to, Sure. Speak to the percentages. Yeah, the the um, so chapter seventy is I don't have the exact number, but it's somewhere I think around seventeen million dollars uh, is sort of our uh, think of it as like our principal 
And if we had anticipated that growing at 5%, it's one number. When it comes in at 1%, it's a lower number to the tune of about $650,000. For UGA, it's in the neighborhood of, I think, $9 million, $10 million. So that's what our general, uh, unrestricted general aid is. And so when that comes in at a higher percent, it's a lower dollar amount threshold, right? And so um, that's the sort of, those are the, those would determine the numbers that we're looking at. Okay, yeah, and so, sorry, I, I wasn't looking for the exact numbers, but just on order of magnitude, right. the chapter 70 is twice as, twice as well. right. okay, so right. a lower percentage right. really hurts, and that ripple effect, um, right. as you mentioned, we feel in the next couple of years. Um, just a comment on Minuteman, because this is something that we had talked about last year when we were deciding on the override amount, and, and Ms. Dufini, you mentioned that that assessment has gone down, and, and it was a, a big concern over the past several years. By, by my um, spreadsheet that I have here, we had seen double-digit increases from fiscal 21 through 24, and now we're, we're down about 4%. So it's good news in the short term. It doesn't completely offset everything. I still think it's something that we need to um, probably have the Minuteman our, our representative in it some point just to see what's going on because I know there were some changes on foundation budget amounts for other members in the district that actually helped Arlington this year in terms of what its net assessment was. Um, and, and then just on the, um, and, and, and more comments than questions tonight, but um, we had mentioned the increases for the town and school budgets or as a result of the override and, and the school increase this year is to help them fund their strategic plan. But after fiscal 25, I believe more than 50% of that five-year plan will be funded through the, a million dollar increase in 24, 3.1 million in 25, and then lower amounts after that. So um, let's, let's hope the uh, House and Senate increase the uh, chapter 78, and, and, and thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Mrs. Mahan, additional comments. Yeah. Would I not have so? No. <laughs> um, I guess um, st starting with Minuteman, I, I agree. I'd love to. Uh, I shouldn't say I'd love to. Uh, leave it to the chair to uh, schedule the our Minuteman rep, as well as um, if we could get an update on uh, the superintendent search. My understanding is they're nearing the finalists. They're doing the background checks, um, which is a very important. Uh, issue raised by many parents who came before us last year. So maybe sort of a dual Minuteman budget and Minuteman superintendent um, update um, when the chairman sure. and the representative says that's a good thing to go to. And that is great news on Minuteman. Um, uh, I know last year we were asked for a one-time six-figure fee for, I think, uh, Minuteman field maintenance or something to do with fields, and they said they may be back, um, and the board said, that it was just a one-year approval. If it happens again, we'd like to see them come back, but it seems as though everything on that vein has really been taken care of, um, which is really, really good news, especially since, like, our public Arlington Public Schools, our Minuteman schools, first and foremost, is education of our students that go there. And um, so that's good news all around. Um, staying with my school comments, I don't expect answers on this because this is the school side. Um, but I anticipate by the final budget, which I think you said was March to the Select Board and Finance Committee, that um, one of my questions is, are they still using on the school side, if you could let me know when I talk to you during the week, are they still using their projections according to the McKinnon report, which just speaking for myself solely has been total waste of money for that. Um, and my other question when on, on the school side would be, uh, when will we get the actual numbers of actual student growth? I know for 24, they have it at 108, and then for 25, 26, they have it at like three, four, and five. So, uh, and, and the, the reason I raise these points, uh, also, you know, I'm not saying my colleagues agree with me 100%, but with the budget's projected shortfall, with the special projects that the board and the manager has outlined, whether it's Park Ave Corridor, Broadway, um, Churchill, you do have union negotiations coming up, and you know, DPW, police fire, DPW is so below and low, it's a joke. Um, I mean, I'm not 
that has nothing to do with um, anything except for that's what it is. But I know going forward, you, you'll be looking for that. So when we can get actual numbers, because that 108 is not um, an actual. We were looking for a person who grew up, grew up looking for, you know, penny nickels and dimes to add up to a dollar, because that's sort of what we're doing. And as the manager said, I think at our last meeting, uh, the last time I got a report from the previous town manager, Mr. Pooler, and you can take it for what it's worth, um, the number he presented to the board, again, you can take it for what it's worth, was $9.9 million um, of opera funding that wasn't committed, that needs to be. So if it's not that number, if you could just give a brief explanation why it's only 9 versus 9.9. .9. Um, and if it's not that number, I can kind of figure out maybe why it's not, um, which has nothing to do with Mr. McGee or Mr. Feeney. And I want to thank you, Alex, Mr. McGee, for saying special education. That's something that was a tickler with Mr. Pooler and some previous people. Um, SPED really is, you know, it's not as bad as the R word, but it's, you know, and I had mentioned that many times, it never seemed to stick. So um, it's a little thing, but it means a lot to a lot of little people. Um, am I correct that right now, or am I incorrect that we don't actually know our free cash has not been certified yet? Uh, our free cash has not been certified this year. It will be at some point in the spring summer time frame. Um, our last certification was done over the summer and it was at 17.88 million, I think. Um, and then, so as everyone, as you all know, and everyone for at home, uh, we have a policy where we use 50% of our last certification in our next fiscal year as a revenue source. And then I know we always look to every year certification by DOR and, and a, a large part and parcel of that has to do with um, the assessor's office and board of assessors is, is in a couple of years, two, three years ago, there was a delay in that because of something that didn't follow a timeline. Has that all been, everything that needs to be submitted to the Department of Revenue been submitted and have their numbers come back certified yet or is that just not in the natural course of time it's coming out? We have submitted our new growth figures for FY24. I'm not certain if they've been certified. They will certainly have been by the time we're doing our free cash numbers. Um, we won't have our final free cash until we have our the close of FY24 done and we look at what sort of money was unspent by departments, what money can be turned back, what money needs to be encumbered for th that has been promised in 24 for an ongoing sort of expenditure that'll trail into 25. And so uh, sometime like probably early July, we should have a real good handle of what our free cash will be and then it will be certified sometime thereafter. We should have a pretty strong estimate at that point. Okay, and then I know it's not a big number, but it's six figures. Um, the previous town manager, Mr. Chaplain, sort of had a policy or protocol regarding the municipal building trust fund and how that would be applied. Um, I'd be interested if you could let us know by like March if the formula that Mr. Chaptelain um, had been using for the Municipal Building Trust Fund, if you're going to continue with that um, practice, or if it's something that, m m I would ask you to relook at it. I'm not saying how Mr. Chaptelain applied it as a practice or a policy. It's, it usually runs anywhere from six to 700,000, and I don't know what the interest, if any, does on it. But if you could just review what his policy was and say if you just want to continue with what he had done with that or if there's something else, especially, again, where um, you're going to be looking uh, to close that $1 million, uh, capital improvements and budget negotiations. Did you want to? I was just going to say, as of right now, we are projecting to hold what had been the underlying commitment to the Municipal Building Insurance Trust Fund of, you know, growing it at around 2% annually. And then um, I know it's embedded in here, and we won't know until we get further in the fiscal year, but um, I myself believe under uh, inspectional service building fees that that will continue to over-project. I think the town, I call it a, a three-down cons uh, conservative financial plan. Um, and. I've said this before that, you know, if you see something that comes in at, you know, 150, 200, 300, 400 percent, 
and continues as a trend, that that's not necessarily a good thing. But um, I do think for, um, and we can't know it until we get further into the fiscal year, but I think under uh, building fees, inspectional services, similar to the uh, fire department ambulance program, um, and I'm not, and I know there's been some talk about uh, the marijuana cannabis calculations, and those seem to be sort of spiking a little bit further down, so that's another thing we have to take into account. Um, and I'm assuming that, or can I ask the question, just because it's in here somewhere, and I just don't have the expertise to find it, but regarding the Arlington Recreation, um, what I'll call capital improvement plan, relocating um, to the Parmenter School, uh, the cost for that, is that already embedded somewhere in the budget under capital planning? Is it already embedded and or uh, out of the Arlington Recreation Department um, budget? Or is that another number along with the million dollar shortfall, townside negotiations for contracts, capital improvements that, that this board has discussed, that that's another thing you are gonna have to balance? No, that is already accounted for in the Recreation Department's enterprise budget. So um, if you could, maybe by March, um, find out on the school side, which I don't expect you all to know, um, if they're using the McKinnon report numbers, I'd rather have Arlington Public School report numbers and what that actual, it's not 108, um, what that actual number is, because again, that'll give us um, some funding there. And as uh, my other colleagues have said, congratulations on your First budget presentation, it's one of the things I always say, it can never be too long because it's, it's a really important item. And sometimes at town meeting when we get kind of get bogged down in four or five different cogs and something else and the budget comes up and it's done sometimes in under 20 minutes, I'm like, ah, oh! because um, to me that's uh, something that warrants the time and attention and for anyone watching at home, it may seem like, you know, we're really um, dragging this out, but this is something in terms of, uh, especially for the t town hall staff that, um, and moving forward with the override commitments, but especially with uh, town services side, um, which the override didn't really, in my opinion, contain really that much money, um, but the residents of the town as well as the town administration have a certain level of service that not only do they want to continue but um, in some areas um, enhance. <clears throat> and I know that's a brand new dance for both of you. Um, <laughs> this is sort of your first flying solo year on that. So I do appreciate um, the time that you, you've put into this, you've given to us here tonight. And as I said to Mr. McGee about a week or so ago, and Ms. Tafini knows this, uh, I'm certainly going to be scheduling some time, um, not at the select board meeting, <laughs> um, just to go a little further in depth, um, maybe the beginning of March, um, if appropriate, um, to save everybody sort of the background nuts and bolts of this. But um, I, in light of the projected shortfall and, and uh, some of the other commitments that I know we're really gonna have to find a way to uh, balance. I really do feel um, encouraged and um, glass half full, or in my case, I'm just happy to have a glass, you know, <laughs> if there's anything in there, that's, that's a bonus, but um, I, I, I feel uh, very well taken care of under the seat of uh, our uh, town finance director, deputy town manager and town manager. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan, and our colleague over Zoom, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to echo the last thing that um, Ms. Mahan said, you know, about me just feeling good about me, the leadership, me and my financial team. And Mr. Hurd, I'm really proud of you. That was a curiosity question that I didn't even have, so so thank you for asking that. You know, I do have some some questions and some thoughts, you know, uh, about uh, the the further out in the future. Uh, but I haven't had a uh, well due to conflicts on both my part and Mr. Feeney's part. You know, after the budget came out, we weren't able to meet. So so uh, we talked a little bit about me specific items of the budget, I mean, in our last meeting, and I'm just going to save my um, my my 
questions and, and comments made for more discussion with him um, in the near term. And then if something productive comes out of those conversations, we'll talk about it um, at one of these board meetings. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hurd. And I should thank you guys for your pre first presentation. Um, and then my only note, Mr. Feeney, was as a fellow lefty, you should know that you got to sit on that <laughs> side of the table <laughs> and you know, bumping elbows as you're trying to write. The next is somebody. Other than that, great presentation. But just some food for thought for next year. Thank you very much. <laughs> you write that down too, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Fridays don't have to think about that. that um, Fridays oh, is just. Oh, oh, yeah. So we have a, a motion to receive by Mrs. Mahan. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. DeCourcy. And this is a roll call because we have a remote member. Attorney Cunningham. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. By zero vote. Thank you very much. This brings us to the consent agenda. And on the consent agenda, we have the minutes of meetings from January 8th and 22nd of this year. A reappointment to the Historical Commission of Diane Schaefer, term to expire January 31st, 2027. And a vote authorizing in-person early voting for annual town election and police details for the presidential primary, March 5th, 2024, and the annual town election on April 6th, 2024. Julie Brazil, town clerk, and there is a memo in the select board's agenda and minutes um, detailing that information. Do we have Move any approval. questions? Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? So on a motion by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5-0 vote. Thank you very much. This takes us to item six and seven. Both of these are public hearings, and we have the community development uh, block grant, a performance update for the program year 2023 and 2024 uh, is the first one, and this is Mary Mazinski, community development block grant administrator. It's wonderful to have you this evening. Thank you. I hope I got your last name close to right. It was perfect. <laughs> uh, and let's, uh, Trudy Cunningham, do we need to take these separately? Is there a, uh, the, these two different items? Do yes. Yeah, all right. So we'll start with the performance update first. I'll ask for any public comment, and then we'll move on to item seven. Great. Well, good evening. I'm Mary Mizinski, the Community Development Block Grant Administrator, or we call it CDBG, um, with the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, so first, I'll present the mid-year report and a summary of applications, and then a summary of applications for the upcoming program year uh, for the board's endorsement. Uh, then the program year 50 applicants will have the opportunity to present an overview of their proposed programs and activities. So this currently is the 49th consecutive year that Arlington has received HUD funding through the CDBG program. We are currently in year four of our five-year consolidated plan. Arlington is on track to meet the CDBG goals the community set to accomplish for this five-year plan period. The goals for economic development have already been exceeded. There are a wide, wide range of uses that benefit Arlington residents, especially households with low and moderate incomes. Over a million dollars has been allocated to the affordable housing, housing, public parks and infrastructure, and public services just this year. Some highlights from the mid-year report by category include, for affordable housing projects, the Housing Corporation of Arlington is using grant funds carried over from previous years to continue capital improvement projects within their affordable housing portfolio. HCA's program year 49 projects are at midpoint and on schedule. HCA's projects completed so far this year include window replacements and a replacement of a failed chimney. Arlington Housing Authority has undertaken a large capital improvement projects at um, the Hauser Building at Brick Village. Um, the program year 48 roof replacement project is expected to be completed this spring, and the Program 49 building exhaust fan project will go out to bid this month. Caritas Communities projects have been uh, delayed due to staff turnover and supply chain issues. Their Program Year 47 capital improvements were completed in September, and their Program 48 improvements, uh, which include a kitchen renovation and seven bathroom renovation, are expected to be completed this month. 
Uh, and then for public service programming, which provides essential health, recreation, employment training, after school, and transportation services. CDBG public service goals are measured by the number of low to moderate income participants who have benefited from their program. At midpoint this year, 617 Arlington re residents have benefited from CDBG funded public service activities. This represents about 46% of the collective goal for public services for program year 49. All public service activities are on track to accomplish their goals by the end of the program year. Notably, the Boys and Girls Club Scholarship <coughs> Program has already exceeded their goal for the year. Arlington Youth Counseling Center, Arlington's uh, Council on Aging Volunteer Coordinator Program, the Recreation Department Scholarship Program, and Fidelity House's Mononymy Manor Outreach and Jobs, Jobs, Jobs programs have achieved more than 50% of their goals by mid-year. Um, and then for public facilities and improvements, the Robbins Memorial Flagstaff Plaza at Town Hall project was completed in October. Food Link's solar panel project was completed in July, uh, and their new so solar panels went live in August. And Robbins Library ADA Accessible Restroom Project is being prepared to go out to bid. And then under Planning and Administration, that's our final category. The Department of Planning and Community Development manages a number of CDBG funded projects. The Planning Department is in the preliminary stage of the town's master plan update process, working to develop additional plans for the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund and conducting analysis to advance recommendations for Connect Arlington Net Action Plan and Affordable Housing Action Plan. Um, and then lastly, uh, Envision Arlington released the annual town survey in January, and the survey is available to take online until March 4th. So that concludes the CDBG mid-year report. Do we have any questions or comments? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Just one question. Um, I don't know if you know the answer or not. <laughs> but for the scholarships for the Boys Club, mm -hmm. How are they exceeding the, the anticipated? Are they reducing the the amount of the scholarships that they're giving? I, they must have because their initial goal, or it was configured differently, because their initial goal was to assist, I believe, fifty five individuals, and they wound up assisting seventy seven. Okay. Yeah, it just seems like with a set amount of a scholarship, you can't go over that. But I'm it sure might have been very figured it out. There are several different programs too, so yeah. it might vary that way as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board before we turn to the public for a public comment? Yes. I guess I would um, Mrs. Mahan? move receipt of the oh, FY 23-2024 yeah. uh, performance update. Okay, and this is a public hearing. At this time, if any members of the public wish to comment <coughs> on the performance update for CDBG program year, uh, please raise your hand in Zoom or in the room. Anybody? Do you agree with me that we see no hands raised, Ms. Mar? That's correct, Mr. Chair, okay. no hands raised. Thank you very much. Um, on a motion to receive by uh, the report by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Uh, don't go away. <laughs> I, item seven. Uh, shockingly, the CDPG requests for fiscal 25 funding, and uh, unsurprisingly, the same guest. <laughs> well, thank you. We'll continue on with the overview of the uh, program year 50 funding requests. So, in recent years, Arlington has received an entitlement grant of just over a million. We plan to receive the grant of this size again this year for program year 50. We estimate the program income for the upcoming year will not be more than about $12,000. Um, the program income funds that have been trending downward, um, as there are only eight remaining Arlington home rehab loans generating interest. Um, so the grant awards will be budgeted accordingly. So for this application period, we received 18 applications. 
um, including new and returning applicants and projects. The full application portfolio is included with tonight's meeting materials and available for review. Um, we received applications for two new public facilities and improvement projects this year. Uh, one is a green um, infrastructure project to complete a flood resilience design for the Lower Mill Brook and a project to redesign the Foot of the Rocks parklet at Mass Ave and Lowell Street. Um, and then the Department of Planning and Community Development requests for funding includes CDBG program administration and a portion of the planner's salaries while working on CDBG related activities. These activities involve data gathering and analysis, survey creation and implementation, community engagement, land use planning and zoning activities, and affordable housing studies and plan implementation. Planning objectives for program year 50 include long range planning for housing and community development studies to help in the creation and preservation of affordable housing. To help provide other benefits and to help provide other benefits to low and moderate income population of Arlington. Um, and then also, of course, the development of a comprehensive master plan update. So the next step in the application process is for the CDBG subcommittee to meet again and then to draft a budget recommendation which will be presented to the board for endorsement. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. And at this time I'd like to request that the um, public hearing uh, be turned over for applicants and they'll be invited to share a brief overview of their proposals. Absolutely. And I will note for the public's benefit that the uh, complete applications uh, that Ms. Mazinski referred to are available online in the Select Board's Agendas and Minutes page. And I appreciate the level of detail. enjoyed reading those this weekend. Thank you. So uh, let us, let's go ahead and move to the public hearing. And then after that, we can have comments and questions from the board. And so if there are, are people here who want to comment on the applications uh, in the room, please your, raise your hand or in Zoom the same. We have a hand raised in the room. Welcome. Come on up. And we noted a couple of names in the Zoom. We can get those, uh, bring those in here ready. Welcome, just uh, please introduce yourself and uh, we'll, let's uh, keep comments to three minutes, please. Um, my name is Lisa Urban. I work at Fidelity House and uh, I'm noticing this chair. I hope it doesn't cause me to talk longer because I'm a little more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Which you might be finding with, I guess, a lot of people. Um, I just want to thank you for your past support and also for the opportunity to ask again this year. I know it may seem similar, oh, she comes every year and asks, but the program itself addresses, it's new every year. Like we're gonna get kids that it's their first time coming. It's not new, you know, it's new to them. It's not same old, same old. And then even the kids that come back that we're trying to help are um, at a different stage in life that they were a year ago and have different needs. and. Um, hopefully are a little bit more active and um, becoming a part of the community. Uh, one thing that we, we do a couple things, I put two applications in. One is for our outreach program, Manami Manor Outreach Program, and uh, it's threefold. It's, we do an on-site program uh, for, and it addresses a little bit younger kids too that can't come to Fidelity House or um, can't get there, and also parents who may not want their kids traveling. Um, so it's a chance for us to meet the kids right in their neighborhood. And then um, during the school year, we provide scholarships for all our different programs, so whatever their needs are um, and interests. And then during the school year, or sorry, during the summer, we have a day camp, and we really, we provide the transportation, we go down, we bring them to Fidelity House. And then they go to our summer day camp, swimming lessons, um, nature, you know, it's, it's an old fashioned feel, it's archery, it's, you know, being with everyone else and learning and being a kid. And then we make sure they get home uh, by transportation also. And we found that transportation and um, just experiencing camp has been huge. And we've had a great, amount of kids that do it every year and if I could I'd ask for you know double the amount because what we're finding is we're getting a ton of kids and we can only give them each a week because you know do you give one more to some kids and others we want to make sure so we're getting the quality the quantity but we really are trying to get a little bit more quality too 
where they're here longer. I mean, 100% want to come to camp longer, and I don't blame them. I, it's fun. It's great. But uh, reality is what it is. So um, I did put in a request for 21000 uh, And then um, we have that Jobs, Jobs, Jobs program that doesn't seem like it addresses a lot, but those staff that we are able to get really have an impact on the kids and really on the families. You know, their, their funding that they get, they really use to help their family too. So it really is something that benefits us, benefits the kids, benefits the family. So it may seem like it's, oh, it's a small thing, but it, it really has a big impact. So just want to say thank you and hopefully it happens again this year and um, thanks for your time. Thank you for the work you do in the community. And uh, do we have anybody else in the room who wants to comment? Uh, come on up. I reset my three minute timer. That was exactly three minutes. Well done. <laughs> Hello everyone. I'm Andy Doan with Arlington Eats. Uh, good to be here tonight. Um, we applied for program funding. This is the first time since I think 2020, because um, I know that the budget is very small for program funding and there's a lot of great organizations. In fact, all the applicants are partners of ours. So it's a small amount of money, but there's a lot of need out there. Um, so I felt like it was important for us to demonstrate the need that we're seeing in the community right now. Um, so many of you know that uh, we, we moved into our brand new facility a year ago. And in the past year, we've seen a 35% increase in the number of families we're seeing. So we're now seeing between 425 and 450 families every week in our market and home delivery programs. Um, and we recently learned from the Greater Boston Food Bank that the number of Arlington residents and households that are food insecure is 20%. That's, all, that's more than double, almost three times as many as 2021. I mean, we all feel it when we go to the grocery store, right? You get to the checkout counter, you see your receipt, and you're like, how can this be um, that I'm spending this much on groceries? And so this is even more of a hardship for many of our residents here in Arlington, and that's why we're here to provide services. Uh, we spend $300,000 just on food in our annual budget. So uh, we requested $30,000. Um, that's kind of a drop in the bucket to be able to provide the fresh produce and meat and dairy and, and items that we aren't able to get donated that we do have to, to purchase. Um, but just lastly, I want to mention that we had a couple of our guests provide letters of support for our application this year. And uh, one particular woman is a volunteer and a board member and a guest. Um, and she is a professional museum, a professional musician. Uh, and her small business does not have regular steady income like it, she gives lessons she performances it's up and down and so she has turned to Arlington Eats for a reliable place to get uh, her food so there's so many of our residents that are coming to us and uh, we hope that we can find ways to partner with the town to address this need thank you thank you very much and thank you for everything that you do it's good to see you uh, do we have anybody else in the room who wishes to comment before we turn to zoom Okay, so let's uh, let's start with Christine Shaw for the uh, remote uh, participants. Good evening, Ms. Shaw. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all from, from afar, but good to see you. I'm Christine Shaw, the Executive Director of the Council on Aging, and um, I do also really enjoy being here every year to present um, our CDDG applications. Um, we rely heavily on this CDVG every year um, this year is no exception. We um, have submitted our three applications and I wanted to take just a couple minutes to um, remind you um, all of the good work that's funded by CDBG every year. Um, a big chunk, two out of the three of our applications are focused on our transportation program and the volunteers that help make it run and the um, staff position that has both of those functions. So. Our transportation program is an enterprise fund in the town. Um, CDBG every year helps us with um, a $30,000 um, grant to offset the income for the enterprise fund for transportation. Um, just to give you a snapshot, I did include in the materials um, just one day of what our van schedule looks like. I think it kind of is very telling to see the amount of rides that just two um, eight passenger vans that you probably see around town do every day. Um, we provide um, about 9,000 rides per year. 
and it was good to see um, Andy Andy Doan just right before me, but we are the transportation partner for Arlington Eats and almost 300 rides per week um, we do for um, Arlington Eats visitors as well. Um, we have, like I said, the two vans, we have partnerships with the local taxi company for a discount taxi coupons. And we also have a great partnership with Uber um, as more people start um, in, in the older adult age range using cell phones, we help them with an Uber central platform. You don't need to have a cell phone to do that, but we're trying to do that as much as we can for out of town medical rides, especially when people need to get there outside of the van hours. Um, we've increased our volunteer drivers as well, because as you all know, there's um, hardly anything that, that replaces um, a reliable person that will drive you to your medical appointment, make sure you get where you need to go and take you home afterwards um, with that personal touch. Um, and we also um, do a lot of things for people helping with their transportation, um, such as getting their MBTA um, discount senior Charlie cards for them. And, um, and really anything that they need transportation wise, they call us and we help um, match them to the transportation um, program that works best for them. And we try to allow people to have as much choice as possible. Um, we have an absolutely wonderful um, volunteer and transportation coordinator who's been with us now um, since before the pandemic. And um, that position is the second application. She not only manages all of the transportation and the volunteers for the transportation, but also an additional 200 plus volunteers that run all of the COA programs throughout the year. Um, so that position is, I would say, vital to us. It's a 28 hour a week position and other staff um, fill in that need um, in, the, in the off hours as well. So um, finally, the third application is focused on adult um, day health programs with our partner Cooperative Elder Services Inc. on Broadway. They are a longtime partner um, of ours and really the work that they do in their facility is work that we cannot do at the community center through the Council on Aging. They serve um, people that are have much higher needs than we have the capacity to deal with. Um, they have um, they do they do excellent work and excellent programs all day. And what these scholarships um, do under this application is allow Arlington residents to try out their services for roughly um, it's about 12, 12 days of service. So if um, there was a family that seemed like they'd be a great fit, we would um, help them and connect them and get them a scholarship so they could try it out for um, 12 days. So we have a close partnership with them and there are um, many Arlington families that didn't know what a, what an adult day health program was that were able to get connected because of these scholarships. So thank you very much for all of the support over the years. I appreciate it. Very good. And I think we'll be seeing you a little bit later. Uh, <laughs> yes. Let's go with that. Uh, go next to Kimberly Sarah, Operation Success. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Kimberly Sarah. I'm an Arlington public schools teacher. This is actually year 11 for me. Um, but in the last few years, I've taken over operations and success from Janet McGuire and CD CDBG has been doing a great job ever since operations success opened um, to helping fund school supplies and office supplies for the kids. Our proposal looks a little bit different this year. Um, for those of you that don't know, we provide academic assistance for students that live in Monotomy Manor in grades six to 12, Monday through Thursday from seven to 8.30 with, um, from volunteer teachers that work in APS. And so far since this opened, um, back in like 1999, we've been doing that, we've seen success with it. Um, and we shut down during COVID and since then our numbers have been growing and growing and growing. Um, and one of the things we're asking for this year is not only help funding the school supplies and the office supplies, but we've also seen um, the importance of having students that live in low income housing be able to access events that their, their peers and their friends do as well that are talked about at school. So that's also part of our ask is um, some money to go to events and life skills classes, like take them to a Massachusetts based sporting event or take them to a cooking class or something like that. Um, I've seen firsthand in my classroom what students that can't afford to do things like their peers 
what impact that has on them. Um, and we're trying to really support these kids both academically and socially, emotionally. Um, and we think that's a really big part of making sure they are feeling connected to their community. So for instance, we did a fundraiser last year and this year we actually used some of those funds to take the students to a Celtics game last week. Um, and it was some of the best times these kids have ever had. We have great pictures of it. They loved everything about it. And I actually saw the kids the night after we took them and so many of them at homework club were saying how much all of their friends asked about it um, and how connected they were feeling to kids at school because of that experience. So we're definitely still on the academic side of things and making sure they're getting their study skills, their time management skills, executive functioning, like that is our primary purpose. But in addition to that, we're trying to support their social emotional well-being and their connection to the community. So that's why our proposal looks a little bit different this year. Does anyone have any questions for me I can help answer? Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you being here, stay, taking time out of your evening. It is literally a school night, so uh, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for the work that you do and thanks for being here this evening. No problem, thanks for all the support. Thank you. Um, anyone else in Zoom that wants to uh, comment <clears throat> on the applications, please do raise your hand in Zoom. Okay. Uh, Ms. Mark? I see a hand raised. Oh, there we go. Uh, a couple yep. Of hand raised. Yep. <laughs> Mr. Just just bring in uh, Mr. Nagel and uh, Ms. Schwartz. And let's um, get a race and see who can turn their microphone on first. <laughs> let's, go, <laughs> let's go with uh, Ms. Schwartz. There we go. Good evening, Ms. Schwartz. I need to unmute. Sorry about that. Hi, thank you. I'm Erica Schwartz, the Executive Director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And um, we have applied for funds, CDBG funds, for improvements to our existing portfolio. So largely for time-sensitive capital repairs at, you know, we have 150 units in our portfolio, but 102 of them are the older units built between 1826 and 1966. So. It's a tricky portfolio because there's so many buildings between, you know, two families, four to five unit buildings, nine unit buildings, and then Capitol Square, our 32 unit um, site that's also older. And they all have very different needs. So it sort of takes a lot to maintain that. So um, in the past, we've done new windows, new roof, chimneys, porches, exterior stairs. When there's unit turnover, especially if the tenant's been there a long time or they've just been a little tough on the unit, Sometimes we need to do uh, new flooring or cabinetry, drywall repair. Um, you know, building to building, it can be very different. So we, just for some context, we are in the process of working on a capital needs assessment. And I realized last year I had said the same thing, but I was only about seven months on the job and really underestimated all the demands on my time and the complexity of figuring out how to do a capital needs assessment on a portfolio that's as diverse as ours. It's really we needed to take a slightly different um, approach than would be typical because of how scattered site it is. So that is actually finally underway now and we're really looking at you know big picture plans, big improvements we need to make and we'll be putting together a much larger you know financing plan for that. But in the meanwhile, we do have these needs that come up that the CDBG funds are so essential to make sure that we're staying on top of those. Um, so, and we're not just looking to the town you know, even for these nearer term things or for the larger term, um, you know, sort of longer term plan. I have some free technical assistance that I've gotten from the National Housing Trust to help us think in particular about energy efficiency. Um, there's a foundation that might be interested in supporting us. They've invited me to submit a grant. That might be $50,000. So we're trying to leverage all the money we can because um, the needs are great. As much money as the town can give, like we'll spend it. Um, as you can imagine, you know, it's not cheap to do any of these small projects and they all add up on, on our portfolio. Um, so, you know, I, I heard Mary give the report. Um, technically, from her reporting, we've, you know, we're, we haven't fully expended all the money yet, but in reality, we have a project that's finishing any day now and we just have to get the paperwork in. So there was a lull in us spending in the past in the executive director transition before I came. And now we're pretty much spending it as, as soon as, we, as, as you approve it, um, we've been spending it. So this is really vital funding to keep our properties safe, sustainable for the long term, you know, keep them maintained 
as we, in this moment, sort of look to make this larger plan uh, we'll be, where we'll be looking more at, you know, HVAC systems and foundation issues and sort of some of the really big ticket items. Um, but this money in the meanwhile is so essential for these, um, not necessarily even smaller projects, but significant projects like windows, roofs, porches, stairs, um, turnover, that kind of thing. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for your good work. And uh, I think finally we have Mr. Nagel from the Housing Authority. Good evening, Mr. Nagel. Good to see you. Good evening. Um, thank you very much. On behalf of the Arlington Housing Authority Bo Board of Commissioners, I'd like to thank you for all your past support, um, not only for our for the you know critical capital needs that we need at the Housing Authority to pre preserve our portfolio, but also for operation success, and, and also for these other organizations here that directly benefit our residents. Um, on a daily basis. Uh, the project that we're proposing this year is a, is a repaving project at Drake Village. The current parking lots there are original to when the development was, to when Hauser Building was built in 1975. Uh, what we're finding at this point is that the, the amount of wear and tear at the, at, at the parking lots has reached the point where patching and just ongoing ways to try to prolong the life of it are no longer working. So what we're proposing is a complete repavement, which will help us not only you know, address some of these health and safety concerns, but upgrade the, the parking lot surface so that it's um, accessible for the residents of our developments that greatly need that, um, as well as you know, ensure that some of the crosswalks that we just added are evenly, evenly paved, so it's going to be uh, for those individuals that are crossing as well. Uh, one of the things that's unique about this project for the Housing Authority is that it's not only going to benefit the residents of the Housing Authority, and those that visit the Housing Authority, but it's going to benefit the, the greater community. Um, and the reason I say that is that Island, is that Drake Village is a unique property in that it, it straddles the bike path as well as the Arlington Reservoir and, and Mass Ave. So it's really a vital junction point between these three uh, resources in Arlington. So by repaving and, and upgrading um, this surface here at Drake Village, it's going to make it safer for the pedestrians that use our, our parking lot and roadway on a daily basis. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is be able to work with the DPW um, to figure out when they may be planning to pave the housing, the, the town of Arlington's portion of that road. Um, a great ask, but something I'm, I'm definitely going to continue to work with them on. Um, and some of the other things that we'll be working on with this project are storm, any stormwater mitigation that's needed. And, um, and one thing we're pretty excited about is, is, is looking into adding some EV charging stations, too, and looking at grants to do that. Um, but but thank you again for all your past support and and ha have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you, and, and we appreciate all the excellent work in your team do over there at the uh, at the housing authority. Okay, I think that's it for public comment. I'll turn to my colleagues now for any brief comments. Just as a reminder for our process that we're not um, you know voting on any on any appropriations tonight. The the CDBG subcommittee on which two of our members sit has to do their work, and I think that's the, the best forum for questions of the applicants. So, but any general observations tonight uh, before we move on? Mr. Hurd. Yeah, I would just say um, we did, the subcommittee met last week to go over the proposals, and in my years on the board, I don't think we've ever had to cut so much as far as the funds that we have available and the requests. It's always an amazing experience to be able to go through these and fund as many programs as we can because all of these programs have an absolute direct effect on residents uh, in the town and it, as opposed to the overarching budget that we talked about earlier, you know, it's $5,000 and it's $5,000 that immediately gets put into the community and has a about as much impact as $5,000 will have at any municipal level. Um, but that said, you know, we do, we have, you know, $1.6 million of plus of requests for about a million dollars to give out. So unfortunately we're going to have to tighten the budget. But when we do that, we, you know, we don't want to cut out any individual program, but you know, Everything will have to scale back a little bit, unfortunately. But I do thank everyone for coming and for submitting your requests. And we will get to work on this in the next couple of weeks to to get some recommendations together for the full board. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Mott. 
That's the other half. That's the other <laughs> half of our delegation. The CDBG yes. subcommittee. I want to thank Mr. Hurd for really taking the lead. I was having some technical difficulties. Um, but at our last subcommittee meeting, um, as he stated, the 1.6 million in the request and the 1 million available. And one of the things that's really always frustrated me, but you have to live within the parameters you're given, is um, only 15% of that, <clears throat> which means if we only get a million dollars, it's 150,000 can go to public services, which we'd love to, you know, quadruple if we could, but we're under the limits. Um, and then one of the other things that were discussed that only affected one or two projects, um, well, one facet was, as uh, Ms. Schwartz outlined in her presentation, uh, questions came up about whether CDBG was the sole funding and or are they looking for other sources and grants and, and ways to mitigate the costs, um, which each, each and every one of these pretty much do. Um, and then the other last two questions that were out there before we meet again, um, one was sort of a global one, which is, you know, um, the town manager and Ms. Musinski and um, Ms. Ricker, uh, planning director, going back and, and looking at their budgets um, to see, similar to what we ask our nonprofits and others, is um, any of the expense, can it sort of be added on to um, something else where we anticipate we're going to make, have to make such a drastic cut because the monies are going down because the pool of CDBG cities and towns are going up. Um, but the funding has pretty much stayed the same. So uh, one of the questions, and I don't know if we can ask the chair to go back in his uh, co-chair of, of the Community Preservation Act, but um, in terms of their process, I, I think they're in their hearings right now. Do you remember um, if, if the CPA committee sticks to sort of the time parameter that they've outlined, um, do they usually have, because one or two of these requests are also tied into possible Community Preservation Act. Do you know, they, do they come out in January, February, March? Um, I'm not going to hold you to it, but, or is it as late well, as April? The, the, in past practice, it's usually been early March. Early March. Yeah, but um, yeah, I encourage you to, to uh, speak with the chair of the body who you might know. <laughs> yes, yes, and because <laughs> like Foot of the Rocks and some of the other ones. Right, yeah, exactly, to, to, um, to work out that overlap. Right. Yeah. And then the manager also indicated <clears throat> along with his department heads to see if there are any um, requests that if we can't fill them, um, I don't know, I know they're investigating other things under the budget, but, but also if any of these are one-time requests that could somehow fall into opera if we meet the federal guidelines, and that's a really big if. Um, but um, the manager and his staff did indicate that they're going to really go back and look and try to because that's a big cut, big hit, you know, 1.65, 1.646 uh, request in about a million um, that we have to give out. So, but we'll find a way. We will persevere. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you very much. Any further comments from my colleagues? Nothing for Mr. Corson? Okay, I don't think we need a motion for this since it was just a presentation. So, uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is open forum. Um, Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted on nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. There is a three-minute time limit to present a concern or request. If you are in the room and want to participate in the open forum, please raise your hand. I see a hand raised. Let's start with the uh, chair of the board of assessors. Although I do not presume that that is the capacity under which he appeal appears. Not tonight. All right. All right. Well, we're happy to hear from you, Mr. Jameson, on any topic. Yes. Good evening. Um, my name is Gordon Jameson. I'm a, a town meeting member from Precinct 12. Oh, can I have a handout? <laughs> oh. Thank you. This does count to your three minutes, sir. <laughs> so this does count toward your three minutes. <laughs> yeah, we, you can you want to just pass it down. Yeah. Talking real money here, so you might, I might Thank you a stretch. <laughs> Good to see you. Right. 
So I come to you tonight um, to talk to you about our MBTA assessment. And the handout lists um, Arlington and its neighboring towns and cities in the first column. In the second column, um, the reason for this um, presentation having perhaps um, validity with the state is uh, these the community, the, the um, type of community that it is based upon the MBTA Communities Act. The population, the, the proposed 24 assessment, and then I'll talk about how I prorated these. So for some background, um, the town managers of the past, I, I know Mr. Chaplain worked on this. Um, I think there's a feeling um, I, that, as I'll present here, that we're being over-assessed and have been for a long time. And um, so the, 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 the MBTA Communities Act classifies us as an adjacent community, which is in direct opposition to what we are classified as far as the assessment. So, the, so that, that I think needs to be remedied. And this might be um, how, 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 the, how you decide to do it. It could be directly, or um, if I had been more um, on the ball last month, I, a home rule petition might, might be something that makes the legislature have to pay attention. So let's look at this chart. Okay, let's look at the bottom half first. These are towns and cities, Belmont, Medford, Somerville, and Cambridge, that are all in the MBTA communities relate, related either as commuter rail at Belmont, or all the others are rapid transit, which is the highest rating. The lowest is adjacent in, in our neighborhood. And then you have commuter rail, and then you have rapid transit, which can also include bus and, and uh, commuter rail as well. So if you take those and you do by population, you prorate to Arlington, you see that the numbers are all about three million, three and a half million plus or minus. So that, that, that system seems to work pretty well. But if you look at the top of the, of the chart, um, you see that Arlington is paying as much as those as it would if it was if it had commuter rail or rapid transit for our bus service, which seems to me to be ill-advised. If you take um, Lexington's, which has only bus service and it is an adjacent community, and you prorate that, you get 1.1 million. And Winchester is getting away with bloody murder mm. because they have commuter rail and bus service, and they only pay $564,000. If you prorate that, you also get $1.1 million for us. So this could be $2 million that we're overpaying every year, and I've been here 22 years, that's $44 million that we could do a lot of other things with. So I think this is something that because of the change with the MBTA communities is worth considering. There's obviously the town council will help with the legislation differences, and uh, the town manager and the board can decide how best to do it. But if there were to be a special town meeting um, uh, called this, this spring, uh, this would be a place where that might be a slot, and I'd be happy to vote for it. Thank you, sir. Thank you much. Anybody else want to comment in public forum? <clears throat> okay. Ms. Mar? Seeing no hands raised. Thank you. All right. That concludes open forum. Thank you, everyone. Let's now move to traffic rules and orders and other business. And we have item 8, an update and a uh, potential vote of approval or endorsement. Uh, the bike lane design guide from uh, John Alessi, senior transportation planner, and his team. And while they come up to the table, I just want to uh, commend Mr. Alessi for the process. I was uh, fortunate to be invited to participate in in it for uh, a couple of meetings, and I thought that you know the, I learned a lot through that, and uh, was glad to see a lot of participation by lots of different stakeholders from the town and the community. So please uh, tell us what you've got tonight and introduce your guests. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> So good evening, select board members. My name is John Alessi. I'm the senior transportation planner in the Department of Planning and Community Development. I'm joined tonight by the town's consultants at Tool Design. I have Sneha Adigari, yes, mm -hmm. and right. Stephanie Wire here from Tool Design um, to present on the recently completed bike facility design guide for repaving and restriping projects. And, um, I'm Ms. working on it. Sorry. Give us a, <laughs> just, 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 yeah, just, just we can, we can take a, a, a 
gracious pause for a moment while we get our screens ready. Just hang, just hang tight. Sounds good. Thank you. Deep breath all around. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. So, so this guide will supersede the context. And by the way, you don't need to start the slide. Oh. <laughs> uh, this guide will supersede the context-sensitive bike facility design guide matrix that was developed by the Transportation Advisory Committee and approved by the Select Board in 2015. This is also a project that was started my, by my predecessor, Daniel Amstutz, and I've had the pleasure of bringing it to completion. So I'd like to thank our consultants at Tool Design who have assisted in the project's development and have helped integrate feedback from residents, town committee members, and town departments into this guide. And I'd also like to note that any project that comes out of this guide requiring select board approval will be brought before um, as needed, similar to the Medford Street bike lane project that was approved by this board last year. So with that, I'd like to pass it off to Sneha, who's going to speak about the guide, and we'd be happy to answer any questions afterward. All right, thank you. I'm happy to be here to present um, the final version of our bike guide and give you a little bit of a summary. So I'll go over project goals a little bit, give you a breakdown on a timeline, and then do a little bit of a summary of the content in the short, shortest amount of time I can, I can do it. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, we already done this, so T John has been our project manager, and Stephanie and I have been uh, here at Tool Design um, working on this project. Next slide. Um, so just to orient us towards the goal, as um, John has mentioned, the, the, really, the real purpose of this guide is to provide clear indication to Town Department Public Works on implementation of bike lanes that is context sensitive and is prioritizing um, safety of all roadway users. Now this update was needed so that it would adhere more to recent standards. A lot of the state and federal uh, bike lane standards and guidelines and even funding programs have changed and increasingly a lot of them are requiring um, preference for more uh, separated or protected bike lanes. And the list of those guidelines and some of the grants are, are listed over there. Uh, next slide. Another big goal of this project was to ensure that there is more coordination happening um, and identify how the town planning and community development department can be incorporated into design project, projects and some de decision making around that. And finally, we really wanted this guide to align with plans and goals outlined in other planning documents, including uh, uh, specifically the Connect All Lincoln um, transportation plan. Next slide. Um, so just to give you an overview on what we've been working on since um, the summer of 2023, so we kicked off the project with John at that time. Um, in August, we had our first subcommittee meeting, and this subcommittee meeting uh, you know, really involved a lot of different um, groups within Arlington, including uh, an Arlington parent, uh, ABAC and TAC member, um, Arlington Police Department member, someone from everywhere Arlington. Um, we also had Mr. Helmuth as our um, select board member, a high school student, and a bike rider. So we're trying to really capture the experience of uh, a lot of people living in Arlington and a lot of different stakeholders. Um, so we met with them in August, and they, give us, they gave us a lot of good feedback on what kinds of things they would want to see in a new bike guide. And after that, we developed the draft bike guide in the, uh, in the months of August and September. Um, we had our second subcommittee meeting in October where we shared the draft uh, bike guide, um, and we also shared it with our, the, the Public Works Department, as well as um, TAC and ABAC members who reviewed, it, who reviewed it and gave us um, a lot of good comments that fed into the final bike guide that we finalized um, earlier this year. Next slide. Great, so now let's get into the actual content. Hopefully you all had some time to like, look over it, um, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview. Next slide. So really the design guide um, is structured in the, in the way that you can see on this chart. So at first it gives a breakdown on different bike facility types. Um, it then talks about uh, methodology around how you would go about selecting the bike facility. And then it gives um, an, the actual matrix, which uh, has step-by-step -step instructions on how you would go about um, choosing a bike uh, facility. And one thing I want to note, which you know was on the top of the bike guide was that this is for restriping and repaving projects. So we've like made sure that it, um, any recommendations we're providing in here is fitting within that um, context. Next slide. Um, so just to go over some bike facility types, um, starting out with separated bike lanes, uh, and I'm showing like a little cross section of each of the design 
um, types on this table as well. Um, separated bike lanes are bike lanes that provide exclusive space for people biking, and it's physically separated from vehicular travel using vertical elements. Um, now, they may be implemented at street level with paint and flexible delineators, so that's what you can see on the chart over there. Uh, and it can be done as a part of repaving and restriping project as a result of being able to do it using these temporary materials. Um, next up, we have conventional and buffered bike lanes. These are also on-street bike lanes, um, delineated from traveling with just pavement markings. Um, buffered bike lanes use buffer striping, and that's the image you're seeing on the right-hand side, uh, while conventional bike lanes are delineated with just a single line to denote um, use for bike travel. And then finally, we have bike boulevards. These are interesting. They are meant for low-volume, low-speed streets uh, designed to prioritize bike travel. Um, they really incorporate a whole host of um, treatments um, working together, including signage, including pavement markings, and traffic calming measures intended to ensure that speeds through these roads are not high. So things like speed humps and chicane to really ensure that that low speed nature of the street is preserved while people are biking around the street. Next slide. Um, so going into the matrix itself, um, so the first question that is asked in the matrix is if the street in the is in the town's recommended bike network. Now, the bike network, the recommended bike network was in the Connect Arlington plan. It was identified, um, the streets identified on it had gone through some analysis in terms of um, it being a priority street for biking. So definitely if the street is part of that network, we'd want to consider it for a bike facility. The other thing that we added was um, if the street is a primary route to existing schools, parks, libraries, and regional transit, that should also be prioritized as per Connect Arlington, since those locations um, are important locations to connect with bike, bike facilities. Um, the next part of the matrix looks at um, really understanding the existing characteristics of the roadway. So it asks what the vehicular volume and speed of the street is. Studies have shown that um, you know, speed and volume of, this, of the roadway is closely linked to the comfort that people feel while biking. And you can probably you know, feel that um, when the volumes are really high and the speeds are really high, it is not as much of a safe environment, so you would signal a need for a more separated facility. Um, the chart that you're seeing on the left there is from the FHWA Bikeway Selection Guide, and it kind of breaks down what those numbers would look like. Um, so in our case here, if, you if you're having a street that has volumes over 2,000 vehicles per day and speeds over 25 miles per hour, it really signals a need for a bike lane, whether that is a separated bike lane or a conventional or buffered bike lane. Um, and certainly if the volumes and speeds are exceeding that, it you know, grants for more um, separation. Um, next slide. So assuming that, you know, we meet the criteria of those thresholds of the speed and the volume. Um, it then, the matrix will then ask about the curb to curb width of the street. Um, and the matrix uh, really compares it to the minimum separated bike lane dimension. And I, I've mentioned this before, but Connect Arlington and a lot of other plans have really emphasized the need for um, a prior priority around separated bike lanes. So the first comparison that it's doing is with a separated bike lane. And if the separated bike lane minimum dimension is not, it is met, then it prompts you to a table that really digs into how um, other uses like parking can uh, um, go with the bike lane. If the separated bike lane minimum dimension is not met, meaning the existing roadway width is narrower than that, then you compare it to a conventional bike lane and the, and the widths. And if that is met, it pulls you to another table which has a conventional bike lane table. And I know this all sounds like super wordy because it's hard to explain, um, but it is hopefully clearly laid out in the actual guide itself. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it provides a little bit of context around where those numbers are coming from. This is taken directly from the guide. So you can see on the first row there, we're talking about separated bike lane and sort of the assumptions around the minimum widths of the travel lane, bike lane, buffer, uh, and then you get a minimum that's 34 to 36 feet. Similarly, for the conventional bike lane, that absolute minimum is 30 to 32 feet. But um, you know, if you are looking to see how parking or curbside use could fit within these both of these facilities, then you're going to have to account for that additional width and compare it against that additional width. Um, 
Next slide. So really the, the, the last one I wanted to mention related to the matrix was that it suggests the need for some reallocation of the roadway to provide um, a facility that is really safe. And sometimes that might, might mean to make, that we have to make compromises on available parking. And as such, I know that that's you know, a topic that is very, very timely and a lot of people care about that. So what the matrix does is really recommends coordination with John and town planning department to uh, address like how the changes in parking um, could look like. And, and certainly any removal of parking will be studied on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide. And finally, um, you know, the bike, I, we're really trying to make sure that um, what the DPW um, is looking, what the DPW department is looking for is captured in the guide as well. One of the things that they mentioned was um, guidance around <coughs> using green pavement and how bike crossing should be um, designed and we've included some guidance around that. We've also included some guidance around if the roadway width is inconsistent or is like, um, you know, constrained, like what are some strategies that you could consider so that there is some consistency uh, in the, uh, uh, the network that you're providing. And finally, it also provides some um, uh, opportunities to integrate bike facilities with bus transit in the form of, of like a floating bus stop that could work well with a bike facility. Um, next slide. All right, so that was my really quick summary. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present uh, here today. We're really hopeful that um, the new guide will provide that clear direction on the implementation of bike lanes that is really looking at prioritizing safety um, and is forward thinking and looking to the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you very much. Any, any uh, closing comments, Mr. Alessi? Um, no, I'd just like to thank the board for um, you know listening to our presentation tonight and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Before I turn to the board, I want to invite the town manager to offer any context you may wish about just to give the board some insight into how from where you sit, uh, if we endorse this this um, this guide, how this actually plugs into the work that the departments do, how this will plug into projects that might come before the board, particularly with respect to actually installing bike lanes and, and dealing with parking, and just help us kind of understand uh, understand what it's for and how it works from your point of view. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As Mr. Alessi alluded to to open the presentation, this is really a tool that will be used uh, by our engineering division from sort of the get-go as they plan uh, roadway reconstruction or resurfacing projects to understand uh, what the sub subsequent marking uh, plan may look like, and that happens each year under our capital plan. I think what's worth noting is, right, this provides uh, a matrix by which to make decisions. Obviously, those decisions need to be context specific to, wit to whichever road it is is being planned. And with that, I, you know, I would remind the board that, as Mr. Alessi also alluded to, similar to the uh, Medford Street project, were there to be a significant change in sort of the width of the road, that specific project would be uh, before this board were to have some uh, implication on parking, for example, for the board to consider uh, that particular project in context and to have uh, a say in that particular project at that time. Thank you very much. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I will move endorsement. Is that sufficient? Yep. Move approval. I don't think we're approving anything. Um, I mean, I, I think everything in here is very much in line with Arlington's continued efforts that we've done over the past 15 years, starting way back with the Mass Ave project in East Arlington and our continued commitment to increasing bike infrastructure and connect Arlington, which is very important to residents. Um, I think, you know, as has been said a few times, I think this is, this encompasses our design thoughts for how we want Arlington to look as projects move forward. Any individual project comes before the board on a case by case basis and everything relative to roadways is like economics. It's a efficient allocation of scarce resources in, in this town. Our roadways are certainly scarce resources and you know, I think we have very smart people who work on these projects that try to put together the best uh, best infrastructure 
for getting people to move along, for safety, and for all the considerations that go along with our, with our roadway improvements for all residents and people who use the town of Arlington. So happy to support this. I think I, I like what it does. I think it gives some clear directive and avoids some confusion that can come up sometimes when, when we have these projects. So um, thank you again for all your time on this. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion. And thank you for the presentation tonight. Just a question on, I, I see in the matrix and in your presentation this evening on separated bike lanes. I, I, I do see a picture in there on the floating bus stops. It, there was a two-way separated uh, bike lane. Is that, and, but I don't see it anywhere in terms of the analysis. Is that something based on what you've seen in Arlington that you you wouldn't recommend for analysis, like you would just stop on, on, on the one way, or is, is there guidance there to try to determine that if, if the, the right street came about? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that was just a nice picture I found to clearly demonstrate the, the context. <laughs> it can certainly be done with a bike lane that's going one, one way in each direction. Um, the, way, the context in which I've seen that is it really works well when you have parking adjacent to the bike lane. So if you have a parking lane, then you have the buffer lane, then the bike lane. And when you're approaching an intersection, we, it's, it's often a, a good practice to give um, some space for visibility for, so that parked cars are not like right next to the crosswalk anyway. Mm -hmm. So I can see it in the context where you have a bus stop that's uh, next to the crosswalk and that, that parking, that one parking space and that buffer space <coughs> becomes this bus <coughs> island that can then be the space that people can use to wait. Um, which is, I think, what is shown in the, sure. in the, in the guide, but it's shown as a two-way facility. Mm -hmm. You can do it with a one-way as well. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments, questions for the board? Mr. Diggins? So, um, thank you, I mean, and I got to see uh, this through uh, TAC and through um, everywhere, Arlington, the local streets. One question I didn't ask, I mean, and you mentioned that this has been prompted by, I mean, um, in, different improved standards uh, uh, with respect to bike lanes. I mean, how do you recommend we go about um, keeping this updated, uh, Ms. Alessi? So that's a good question, Mr. Diggins. So I'd say that this guide was created since the previous matrix was completed almost nine years ago. And, you know, standards change over time. I'd say that a good opportunity to revisit this guide would be probably in the next five to 10 years, depending on the change of guidelines from both the state level at MassDOT and at the federal level. Um, I'm not sure if my um, consultants wanna speak to, I don't know, the ch change in guidelines that's yeah. happening nowadays, but I'd say that we're kind of at a point where bike facilities are becoming more you know, progressive in terms of design. So I would say that moving forward, I will, you know, keep up to date with how guidelines are changing and as appropriate, we'll coordinate with my colleagues in the department to update the guide as needed. Thank you very much. Appreciate I think I think I heard Mr. Alessi just say he'd be here for 10 years because that's how long <laughs> it would take to, which would be just fine with me. Um, I, uh, I appreciate this as well. I, I really like I like something my colleague Mr. Hurd said, which is that this is a really a, a good depiction, among, among a, many other purposes, of what we want the town to look like. I think that's really important in and in a, in a big picture and is a statement of vision. And I agree with everything the town manager said and others said that, you know, we have to make these, on the ground, these decisions are tight, they're tough, they are full of compromises. We've experienced that. That's going to continue. Um, but, I, you know, I feel really good that the town is sending a clear message to its residents um, and to its departments and to its staff that, you know, that we get, we get this. We like having guidelines that are up to date. Um, we like promoting bicycling as a viable um, increasingly safe way of getting around town and um, so I'm really excited to see this work continue as well. Mrs. Mahan, sorry I missed you before. No, I'm, I'm trying to not speak unless somebody else asks my question. Oh, well. <laughs> um, now, um, and I know Mr. Hurd made the motion and Mr. DeCourcy already seconded, so I would if that wasn't already done. So. <laughs> I, preface that. Um, so now with this um, bike lane design guide, um, I know there's different verbiage in there in terms of uh, 
what the guidelines are and, and what will be evaluated, how decisions will be made. Um, and I think in one spot, uh, I think it was parking case by case basis. My pr sort of process question is, um, with this guide in place, who and or what department or departments, town manager or select board, in terms of the issues that r different opinions in the community arise, who has the final say? I'm not saying that appropriately, but um, with this guide in place, only because I remember years ago, Alan McLennan, who was our planning director at the time, came in with a 106-page uh, planning open space plan, and I advocated against it for many reasons, and, oh, no, just endorse this. And then <laughs> there were other things that were totally out of our hands, but we had to carry the, the buckets of water on it. So, if, With your permission, Mr. Hunt, I'd like to direct that question to the town manager. Sure, I, I think that's a fair question. With respect to where we're going next in the capital plan, obviously we have a prioritization program for our roads uh, that engineering develops. But with respect to the, you know, once a location has been chosen and there are actual decisions to be made on the ground, uh, I would expect it would be the board that has the final say over, you know, how that curb to curb width uh, is ultimately being distributed as it's been done in the past. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to reiterate that Mr. Manager is saying, and I think that Mr. Hurd put it well, it's an endorsement by the board to authorize and, and, and kind of stand by this matrix, this design plan, but when future projects come up on a case-by-case -case basis, to Mrs. Mon's question, that will remain within the purview of the board. Uh, to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, it strikes me that, um, you know, similarly to the um, discussions we've had in reference to Connect Arlington, that when we get down to the specific situation, we do have to look at, the, look at that um, situation on the ground and, you know, and, and understand that that's how it works. I think those specific statutory interpretations and authorizations and requests still fall within the board, uh, board's purview under, you know, Chapter 40, Section 22. Yeah. Mr. Alessi. Um, I would just like to note that I like to think of this guide as more of um, a conversation starter amongst departments. Yes, the intention is to have the select board be the final say when we are changing the, um, um, the roadway itself, but I think this is a good first step in institutionalizing an ongoing conversation between planning, DPW, police, so that we can come to a um, town staff decision on what is most appropriate with approval from the select board. So. It will be many stakeholders who are feeding into a um, recommendation that's then presented to the select board. So, plan to see me more often. <laughs> thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, and my my only other question is, and and I apologize, um, Miss Adi Hikara. Adikari. Adikari. Sorry, that's you right. may have said this, and the pipe was banging, and I didn't hear it. I'm just. It's just a, a Mr. Diggins curiosity question. When you talk about <laughs> just. <laughs> The, the, um, I also like the Mr. DeGorsey opening preamble. Uh, oh, it's a whole other thing, but anyways. <laughs> but when you uh, speak about green pavement, is that green, because green means so many things, is that green in terms oh. of bicycle pedestrian, or does that also include environmental flooding, oh. top, topographical? So it's like green paint. That oh, it's literally used. green. Yeah. All right, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can you tell I've been in the CSO world too long? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to express some appreciation. I think that Mr. Lessie's uh, comments were really well put um, to, to really give some context to this. Not only as a conversation starter, but I think something you said earlier is that this is a planning document, too, to help the town departments understand kind of what they're going to need to do if we propose a project. And I can see that it generating a lot of efficiencies and understanding, you know, ahead of time. And that's, you know, I'm not surprised this came from a planner, but it is a good planning document. Um, Ultimately, and I think that's it's been good to have this discussion so that we have clarity on what we're signing off on and, and you know that we still have our the responsibility that we have when it comes down to individual projects, but that there's a tremendous value in having an updated document like this that articulates a general vision and provides the ability for the town to act in a more coordinated and efficient way, way to use our resources more wisely. So thank you very much. Any last comments from the board? 
So we have a motion uh, to endorse by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Cunningham. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5 0 vote. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for your time this evening and for your good work. So that brings us to item nine. I believe we're going to have a uh, revisit over Zoom from uh, Ms. Christine Shaw. Uh, this is the mid year update on the senior parking sticker program. So if Ms. Shaw is. It's just taking a second, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I don't see her in the. Oh, there we go. Bring it in. There we go. In, tra in transit. Good Sorry, evening again. Yeah. yeah, I know, it's funny. Um, hello again. Just inter I'll reintroduce yourself for people who may have joined late. Great. Good to see everybody again. I'm Christine Shaw, the Executive Director of the Council on Aging. And um, it was, you know, about seven months ago that I was there in the room with over 100 older adults in Arlington. It was um, truthfully, one of the most exciting things that we have done in a while, and um, we were really thrilled when the select board approved a pilot of a um, of a COA parking sticker program. So, um, on that night, we promised to roll it out in September. Um, so we did, as of September seventh, twenty twenty three. Um, and I'm here tonight to give a mid-year update um, for your request on how, how it's gone and some of the things we've learned and um, just really excited to share it with you. So in your materials, I believe you all received um, three different sheets. Um, like I said, we started on September 7th. Um, we decided um, after talking to other towns that have similar programs to have one set time a week for people to come in and apply if they wanted to do that in person. Um, we also have the option for people to apply online. Um, for quite a while, it was neck and neck between people applying online and people coming in person, which in our um, demographic is always interesting to see that more and more percentage of people doing things online and less in person. Um, but as of, at, this was just last week when I looked at these numbers, um, we had just over 1,500 permits um, that had been distributed. Um, 614 people um, had applied online and 911 in person. So what we're seeing now is mostly in-person applications every week, but we do see some online as well. Um, you may remember that the program was approved for age 65 and above. Um, at the Council on Aging, we have programs um, starting at age 60, and there was some question on if 65 was going to be um, a, something that people would talk about or, you know, ask about. And I'd say it's been very minimal, and I'm probably the first one that was a little surprised at that, but I was expecting there to be more um, questions about age 60 to 65, and although we get them, we've said, you know, as of now, the program's approved for age 65, so on your 65th birthday, come on in and get your sticker. We have had people come, like, the day after their birthday, which is, um, which is exciting. Um, we also limit it to one per household, so if there's two cars and one um, address, we do make them choose which car they're going to put the sticker on. Again, minimal, minimal pushback, sometimes just some brainstorming on like, okay, well, we usually take this car when we go, you know, to the community center. We usually take this car if we're driving during the day when the meters are turned on. So um, I think, you know, there's some strategy that goes into it, but people have had no problem sticking to the one per household. Um, and also nobody complains that there is no cost for the program. I'm sure you're happy or not surprised to hear that, but it's really, really great to have something that people come in, the program, it's very simple to apply. We give them their sticker and they're just really grateful to the town for, um, for running the program. I have heard so much appreciation, um, people who, you know, had never, even come into um, the community center before have come in and they said, you know, this is a really great thing. I, it's just so easy and I'm, I'm so grateful that I just don't have to worry about downloading the app for the meters. <laughs> Little things like that that make a huge, huge difference. Um, and we've definitely felt the positive, the positive commentary about the program. So um, that part has been, has been really great. We have had um, minimal, um, 
issues with replacing stickers. Um, there are some due to, you know, weather related problems and ice scrapers and, um, you know, things like that and others related to people putting them in the wrong spot and needing to get another one to replace it. But out of the 1500 ish, um, there's been 23 um, due to weather related problems and 12 for other reasons. Um, I expected, I was a little worried for a while on the weather related problems. It was due at, right after a snowstorm, but we talked to the company that printed the stickers and they gave us some recommendations for um, people putting them on in the future. So hopefully that will make a um, improvement. And if not, um, we have been replacing them, you know, no problem at all. Um, there's been, the parking enforcement has done such a great job. There's been really minimal, I've only had three people come in that got a ticket and they, and they other, they shouldn't have with the, with the sticker. I expected that to be a lot more of an issue, um, just with, a, you know, a new sticker out in the community. Um, so I really appreciate all that they've done to, um, embrace a new sticker in town. Um, and I, I said a little bit about this before, but the last thing I want to mention is, we have had hundreds of people come in um, to the community center that literally said, I've literally never been in this building before. And while they're there, they get their sticker and then they pick up a newsletter and they sign up for programs. And so it is a great way and it's somewhat unintended that it gets people into um, our building and you know they're like, wow, what's going on here? This is great, what's that class? You know, And just getting them um, to, to know what we do. They otherwise wouldn't have known that. So it's interesting. Um, and it was at the beginning, it was, it was a lot of people coming in every Thursday in person. It did take a lot of staff, but at this point we've now trained, um, two of our tax work off program volunteers, um, to, they, they, they help, um, when people come in in person and give out the stickers on Thursday. So it's been a great program that is now manageable enough for, it to be volunteer run with, of course, staff oversight and where there, if there's any questions. Um, but that is, um, I'd say the mid-year update and it is a pilot program. I believe it was approved for a two year pilot. And, you know, my ask or recommendation would be that it continue, um, but I'd love to answer any questions anybody has if, if there are any. Great, thank you. I will first turn to our colleague who is the uh, select board representative to the Council on Aging. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Ms. Shaw, for the, uh, for the report. I, I have to say that was one of the, the, the better nights I've ever had at select board, the, the, the night we approved that with all the people that came and, and the interest. And, and it, it's interesting that we, I was at some of the Council on Aging meetings and, and um, we never thought that having the sticker program would bring more people into the community center. So that certainly is a great benefit. And it, it sounds like the visibility on the stickers has worked out fairly well because there's only been three tickets that were given in error. Um, and, and a small percentage, as you said, with the, uh, the, the weather related problems. So, I mean, that's something maybe we look at going forward for all our sticker programs to see if it's sometime in the future, maybe we, we bring the sticker inside the vehicle as opposed to being outside. But um, I'm really happy that it's worked out. I've received a lot of positive feedback. I did um, hear from one um, two-car household where um, the person who didn't get the sticker uh, blamed himself for not staying informed. Um, it, his wife beat him down to the community center for the sticker, but uh, it, it, and it was all, you know, he's fine with that. They worked it out, but uh, I, I'm glad <laughs> that this is, has been a positive program, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. Mr. Hurd? Did you move receipt of the I presentation? I moved receipt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I also was going to mention, Ms. Shai, you can't see the gallery right now, but there's nobody in the select board chambers, which is <laughs> a stark difference from when we heard this initially. Um, there was certainly a lot of enthusiasm. We we're really happy to be, get the opportunity to support this then and I think you know of the people that individuals have spoke in favor a consistent theme was you know our elderly in many ways support our schools and our children through through uh, you know 
property taxes and a number of other ways. And this was just a small, very small way for us to show our appreciation. Um, and it's certainly not surprising that there's been excellent reception amongst those who use it. But I think it's a really important uh, program to both give back, but also to help promote, you know, 65 plus residents from driving down Arlington Center and make, knowing that they can get an easy parking, they don't have to pay for parking, they can go to a restaurant or whatnot. And uh, I think it's really important to continue to incorporate our, I don't know if the word elderly is, <laughs> you know, oh, oh, it sounds bad, but our 65 plus residents. I will say I was going over the agenda over the weekend while I was at my parents' house and my mother said, oh, we gotta go in and get our stickers. <laughs> so they're certainly, certainly excited about the program. And um, again, thank you for all the work that you do and look forward to continuing this. Thank Mrs. you. Mahad. Ms. Mahad. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you to Ms. Shaw and Mr. DeCourcy, our representative. And um, I guess what I would do is, and I wouldn't expect that you're somehow keeping track of how many people between the ages of 60 and 64 come in, but um, I, I would leave it to Ms. Shah or Mr. DeCourcy, whether at the yearly update or uh, any other time in the future, uh, whether there are any facets of the program um, we wanna revisit, you know, including age, and it, it, it may be 60, it may be 62, it may, whatever. Um, and I, I think it's so funny that um, I've run into several two-car households um, and I've had more times than not that one of the spouses have come to me because the other spouse or partner already went down and caught the <laughs> sticker and I said hey you snooze you lose you know um, so I'm not asking you you know but I'm not saying what areas of the uh, this uh, sticker program should be re revisited and revised or retuned but um, I would leave it to the two of you in terms of whether it's at the yearly update or any other time from there on after. Um, <clears throat> and I do appreciate you providing the numbers because I got, for some reason I had it in my head after a, a, our biggest snowstorm that we had that there was a big long discussion on several, I think three different lists that I saw about the stickers and falling off and they don't work. And, and then when I saw there were uh, 23 of them, which is a little, uh, about 2.2% of the actual numbers of stickers given out. I thought it was like in the hundreds. So um, I'm glad to see that that's what it was. And I'm also glad that, you know, in the cases that that did happen, that the stickers were reissued. So that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, anything for Mr. Diggins? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for the report. And, um, so, and I'm glad to see such a, a nice uptake, you know, um, um, on the program, I mean, and following on what Mrs. Mahan's um, um, suggestion about me revisiting some parts of the, the program, what do you make of the lack of query uh, between um, of those between 60 and 64? You know? um, we do have people ask, and we say um, it's been approved for age 65. Um, and, you know, it's just not been something that people have really pushed back on. I think. I try to explain the same way as I do for the two car household is, you know, the town, um, there's 11,000 people over age 60 in Arlington. So if all of them were able to get a parking sticker, there would probably, you know, it would be a burden on the program. So we're trying to create a program that is sustainable and good for the town. There's been very few times because of the age question that I've even had to really explain that. And I think we've promoted it as age 65 um, plus from the beginning. Um, so people that have come, um, it's really only been a few that have actually come and not, not seen that it was age 65, I, I suppose. I guess, I'm sorry. So I, I guess my question is, is really, do you think there is no demand there or very little demand there? Or if, do you think that if the program was expanded so that the age limit was oh, dropped, yeah. th there would be demand? You think there would be demand? Yes, there definitely would be demand. Yep. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. all right. It's that's, that's good to know. I mean, um, uh, you seem pretty confident about that, and that, that's, <laughs> that's good. You know, I mean, so I think I'm just being dense here. You know, but what's the link between the the program, I mean, and people who haven't been to the center coming there and 
you know, I just, I just didn't get that. I think they um, hear about the parking sticker or they, uh, a lot of times we're see, having people come in that saw a neighbor with the sticker. Even okay. I'm a little biased, but when I drive around Arlington, I actually notice that a lot of cars now. Yeah. So I think it's a conversation starter. People ask you. how to get it because right. they'll, and so they come in on Thursday evening and they'll have never been there before. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion received by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. By zero vote. Thank you very much. That concludes our regular business and now we will uh, move to new business in our usual order. Ms. Marr? No new business, thank you. Attorney Cunningham? No new business, Mr. Chair. Town Manager Feeney? No new business. Mrs. Mahan? No new business. Mr. Hurd. I just want to give, we're continuing, relative to the 250 um, celebration, but give an update of what, of things that come, particularly this year for in April, um, within the intermunicipal group, we came up with a schedule of events for each city, each town that involved for 2025, so we can help, help coordinate and so in 2024, it's meant as a sort of dry run. A lot of this, the towns are going to be trying to launch events that they'll do in 2025. And this year, in, so for the Patriots Day celebration, we're looking for, at more of a week long of events. There might be some tavern nights. So we work with individual businesses to have, you know, it's this location on that night and have revolutionary era themed events on that week and we're looking at a few other events and a pretty significant um, reenactment that's in the works. We're working with town and staff right now to make sure that it's feasible and, and safe. Um, but just look out for things to come because we're gonna have um, some pretty pretty interesting and fun events that week. And it's coming up on us. Everyone that's involved in the planning is coming up very fast. So uh, we'll look forward to that. But we'll have more information with concrete plans as that comes together. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you for that update. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I just wanted to give a, a brief update. Um, back in September, we had a MUGAR update. Uh, for the board and it, it mentioned that the Conservation Commission hearings would be starting and there was an interesting development last week at the uh, February 1st Conservation Commission meeting. The um, Arlington Land Trust had engaged a hydrologist to take a look at some of the uh, test pit results and groundwater results and uh, that, that individual submitted a report that was just entered into the record last week. It was done a little while ago, and I'm just going to read one sentence from his report. Um, Based upon my analysis, the proposed stormwater management system will not work as designed and may result in increased groundwater levels and surface flooding. And, of course, we've been looking at this issue since 2000. 15 and, and opposed uniformly as a as a community out of flooding concerns and, and other concerns in the area and One of the issues that has now come up is that there are seven or eight Test pits and the reliability of the measurements on those test pits has now been put into question um, Had been put into question previously, but more formally through the submission of this report and there's a recommendation um, that that this individual made that more monitoring wells should be installed so there's more of a measurement period. And I think that's consistent with what we, our position has been a board, as a board that um, if the project is ever to be approved, every single criteria must be met and every test must be met. And if there's doubt um, as to whether it's a test pit or a monitoring well, I say go with the monitoring well. It's not our choice here, but I, I will remind people who are watching that um, there's not going to be a building permit issued unless there's a demonstration that there's a separation between the groundwater level and the, and the lower foundation of whether it's a parking garage or townhouses. So I spoke to the chair, uh, the chairman about this, and I may ask to come back to the board depending on what the, the response is to this report for a further, um, maybe a comment letter to the Conservation Commission 
um, from the board. And, and I will say the proponent, that this letter just went on the record, the proponent is gonna have an opportunity to respond to that. But it is, I consider it a major development and something that's consistent. And I wanna commend uh, one of the people who attended that meeting, uh, Mr. Moore, Steve Moore, who attends a lot of our meetings. And he just really captured the essence that this has been the issue, there should be no doubt. And testing, um, it's something that everybody should be in agreement what the, what the water levels are and more testing is probably necessary. So sorry for the length there, but I, I thought it was, um, given the timing, it was important to update uh, the board and the public on that. Yeah, no, thank you for that update. Mr. Diggins. Well, it's the meeting before Valentine's Day. If you haven't picked up a pattern, that's the day, that's the meeting I always wear my favorite tie. Be So happy Valentine's Day to all of you. And it's always a pleasure uh, spending, you know, Monday evenings with you all. You know, so, so uh, yeah, that's my new business. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, I also have a red tie, but I think I, I really can't, I can, it cannot compare. So... <laughs> And also, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I also. I'm going to leave that one alone. Right. I, I, I got a couple of. I could come back at. Yeah, but anyway, you. sorry. I think at this point we are ready to adjourn. Does anyone care to make such a motion? Motion to adjourn. All right. Second. We have a motion to adjourn by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Cunningham. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Advisor vote. We are adjourned. Immediately, Mike. Bye bye. Take care.